really good to see you again. I, I really appreciated and enjoyed our, our last discussion. So I'm so glad that you wanted to do it again. I've, I've enjoyed the exchanges that we've had. So, so thank you so much. So we thought we would start today because we've had uh, a great, I've had the pleasure of interacting with Mr. Denver and uh, watching his video. You know, he just had a talk with Layman Pascal on what is metamodernity and he's really helped me kind of get straight on the terms. I really appreciate his work. So we thought we could kind of start talking about what that term means to us, some of the ways that we've used it in different things, and, and go from there on sort of the, um, and then go from there on more on what it means to practice metamodernity, to bring it into structure in different things like that. So again, Zach, it's great to see you, and uh, I, I hope you have been well. I've been well. Yeah, it's, it's uh, great to talk to you again. I likewise have uh, been thinking a lot about our conversation, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really good to be talking to you. Um, okay, so should we just, should we just dive into Yeah, meta sounds good to me. Like, what is metamodernity? Defining our terms, I think, is, yeah. is important. And kind of tedious, but very important. <laughs> to define um, okay, so I would lay out a progression from the ancient world to the modern world to the postmodern world, and now we have the possibility of moving into the metamodern world. Mm. Um, and so for me, the ancient world is characterized by a commitment to a truth uh, which is held with certainty, and that certainty is uh, derived from belief in a, a revelation from the past, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I feel like that's pretty, that's pretty common to most, pretty much all ancient traditions. There's oh, yeah. some big revelation in the past, and we have been carrying it on ever since, right? So the, the symbol that I would use is the torchbearer. Right, mm -hmm. so that the ancient man is one who who receives the fire of tradition and carries it on into the future. But there's a there's like a duality there, right? Because there's there's the positive aspect of that, which is like, hey, I will hold this torch that was given to me by my father so that I can illuminate the way before us. But there's also like the the torches and pitchforks aspect mm -hmm. of that, right? Oh. So it's like I have this fire. And I was given this fire by my father the same way that he was given it by his father. And I will bring this fire forward, right? And so if you're standing in my way, you will get burned by it. But if you're with me, then you will be illuminated by it and the, and the way will be shown to you. Um, and so obviously, <laughs> there's, you know, there's, like a, there's a give and take there. So it's not, it's not good or bad. It's just, it's just the torchbearer. Mm. Um, and so then we move into the modern world and in the ancient world certainty was upheld partly because people lived within isolated groups right as a person in the ancient world you belong to a people and your people had a tradition singular um and so as a as a person of your people you could either believe in the tradition or not or i guess you could believe in it to the extent that you did but that was the framing is there's a tradition so if, if you said in the ancient world john found religion you wouldn't ask what religion did John find, right? right. Because there's only one. Um, so then moving into the modern world, you get all these different peoples living together and they're all making different truth claims based on different revelations from the past. And they start to realize that their truth claims are incompatible with each other. And they start to look for a method by which to discern truth in the, in the present rather than a, uh, a certainty based on a revelation in the past, right? Because they have to sort through all these different truth claims. Um, and so from here we get, I would say, like, I see a split that happens in, in the modern world, um, where this kind of dualism enters the picture, right? And we have mm. the objective and the subjective, which were not, as far as I'm concerned, correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but I would say that that, that wasn't really part of the ancient worldview, that no. the ancients were, were interested no. in like above and below, right? It was about pattern and manifestation. And mm. they would try and figure out how those two things work together. Mm. Um, whereas in the modern world, that that sort of incarnational view of the pattern being manifest in the world, that sort of broke down. And we got to have this idea of like the noumenon and the phenomenon, right? The, right. the object and the subject. Um, and so from there, you get sort of two worldviews one that says that the, the quote-unquote real patterns are out there in the objective world and that we can uh, come into conformity with reality by studying and observing and analyzing the objective world um, and that would be I think empiricism 
according to philosophical tradition. I mean, I'm going to, I'll lay this out and then, and then, you know, <laughs> I'm wrong at any point, but, uh, um, you get, you get that worldview on the one side. And then on the other side, you get, I guess, I don't know if you call it romanticism, but you get, uh, an idea that the real patterns are sort of in here within the subject and that we can bring reality into, we can bring the world into conformity with reality by sort of projecting and expressing these patterns from within, right? And so we get the, the analytical proof on the one side and we get the art object on the other side, um, which is another modern invention. This is something that Jonathan Pajot talks a lot about is how in the ancient world, the, uh, like, we didn't, we didn't say that object is art, right? Art was the process that brought about an object, like the art of furniture making, right? But to say, is that chair art? Like, no, the chair is a chair, right? The art is the process that creates the chair. So you could say right. the art stays with the artist. Um, but in the modern world, mm. we get the art object, mm. um, where we start to say that painting is art, that, you know, that statue is art. Um, and this is done, I would say, to replace, to fill the lack left by the sacred, right? Because in the ancient world, they had sacred images, but those images were uh, sacred. They were, they were important. They evoked a certain uh, response in the individual because they were connected to the tradition, right? Because they, like, I mean, if you look at, at medieval iconography, it's very, like, the the style is very sober and very sort of like it's not evocative in the style, but obviously people had tremendous uh, attachment and tr tremendous it evoked a deep response in the in the individual um, because it related to this whole story that those people were living in. Um, but then in the modern world, when that that uh, story falls apart then what's left is like, well, these, uh, these images are evoking this response because of the actual physical properties of the image, right? Like you can imagine if you have a photo of, you know, your family, um, that photo is really important to you, right? Like, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Pulp Fiction. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he, you know, okay, so he's got the watch, right? It's like, and he would have gotten away, except that like, he has to go back for his dad's watch, right? Right. Um, because it has this whole story attached to it. But, but the watch is just a watch. You know I mean, right. I feel like what happened in the modern world is we lost track of the way that objects are given meaning based on their relationship to a story. And we started to say this object has meaning because of the physical pro properties of the object, right? Hmm. So that's the hard object. Hmm. Um, and symbolically, I would say that here you have the brainiac and the artsy fartsy. That's, that's the language that I like to use. Um, so you have you have the analytic the analytical brainiac who wants to to prove that this is true, right? Like it, it's the the analytical proof replaces scripture because in in the ancient world, scripture or the tradition, you know, it doesn't have to be a written scripture, but the tradition, the lineage, uh, sort of proved that something was true, right? It's true because it comes from the tradition. Um, but once we lose faith in the tradition, now it's like it's true because look, I proved it. Right, and mm. we have these whole rationalist systems to uh, to back that up, um, and so I was like, for me, the modernist can very easily become tyrannical, right? Mm. Especially the analyst, because like, if I say, look, I've proved that this is the right move, and you're sort of like, well, I don't know, like <laughs> it doesn't feel right. It's like, well, what do you mean it doesn't feel right? Like, I proved it, you know, and it. Uh, in, in, in the mind of somebody who has attained certainty through a rationalist process, he is justified on in imposing his truth onto other people who don't accept it. Because it's like, well, I've, I've seen it right here. I've checked my work and this is true. Um, and if you can't see it, then that's just because you're irrational. And so I, as a rational person, should impose my will onto you. Um, and we get this, we, in the modern world, people try and have these closed systems, right? These certainties, these uh, theories of everything. We want right. to like figure it out and then we're done, right? Um, and so, so that's the modern world as I see it. And then you move into the postmodern world, which I, to me, the postmodern world is purely deconstructive. And I don't know if you would disagree with this, mm -hmm. but like when I look at the postmodern mind, I see somebody who just sees truth and and just can't stand it and just wants to wants to deconstruct it right wants mm. to undermine the language um the postmodernist doesn't 
Like if you if you propose something to a postmodernist, you say A is true. He won't say A is not true. He'll say, well, what is A? You know, A is just a word that people made up at some point, and you know, it's it's contingent on all these things, and it's used differently. You know, these the ancient people had a different idea of this what this word meant. And these other people in this other place do it totally different. And so, so how can you say that A is true if you don't if A isn't even a stable word, right? Um, and that's to me that's that's valid. Like I I think that's important to make that critique of the modern world. But it's it's a purely parasitical way of being, right? Mm. Because you know the postmodernist doesn't propose anything, as far as I can tell. Um, and so the symbol here, which I, I didn't come up with, but I, I use, is the zombie, right? The the zombie is the image of of decomposition, but it's not decomposition. Um, like it doesn't bring nutrients into the soil, right? Like last time we talked, I described the the sort of liminal web as doing this process of decomposition, but they're doing a process of decomposition where it takes the, it takes these dead language, these dead concepts mm. and breaks them down so that they can then be reintegrated and can, we can access the nutrients in them, which were not accessible before. Whereas the zombie is the decomposing body that doesn't return to the earth, right? It just stays mm. there as this sort of grotesque decomposing thing walking around looking for brains right the brain is the image of identity of name of certainty of of reason all these things um and so the zombie goes around eating brains so so deconstructing the identity until all that's left all you're able to do is rove around as a zombie uh participating in this deconstructive process um, and so I'm very, like, I'm, I'm very poo-poo on the post I mean, I, I, again, like, and I'm not the first person to say this, obviously, but uh, it, it had its, like, it was necessary, right? Like, right. modernism, the modernists were too big for their britches, they were too certain, and they needed the postmodernists to come along and deconstruct them. But I think what we're trying, what we're starting to figure out now at the end of postmodernism is like, hey, that's not a way to live. Like, you can't just right. live as a zombie, right? You need something more than that. And so I would say that postmodernism ends when deconstruction turns back on itself, right? Because the whole problem with deconstruction is that it's like um, the narrative that we should be skeptical of grand narratives and deconstruct them is itself a grand narrative, right? Sure. Um, and so eventually the deconstructionists are going to look back on themselves and say, hey, we're living in a grand narrative. And, and we need to deconstruct this one, right? But then they're left with nothing. Then they have like, this is, this is when the zombies start to figure out they can eat other zombies instead of, you know, they don't have to just eat people with brains, they can eat other zombies too, right? And so then it's just like total, total destruction of everything ever. That's and so uh, and that's, that's where I kind of feel like we are now, right? And so this, this, is, the, this is the place from which metamodernism can begin i would say is mm. like once deconstructionism deconstructs deconstructionism then it's like finally we can we can start to propose things again right um and so the metamodernist i would say uh accepts the postmodern critique of modernism so it's not a reversion back to a modernist certainty um but like the, the whole postmodern thing is like well truth is contextual and so therefore nothing is reliable. And I feel like the metamodernist says like, well, truth is contextual, but we live in a context and within the context that we live, this proposition is reliable. And I have confidence that this uh, proposition is reliable because it, it coheres to all these different modernist frameworks, right? So mm -hmm. I've, I've applied these different modernist epistemologies to it and they all say, yes, this is true. And it, you know, maybe it allies with the ancient worldview too, right? So it's, we're looking for, for uh, sources of confirmation to bolster our confidence rather than sources of proof to bolster our certainty um, in the metamodern world, is what I would say. And the symbol I would propose here, sort of, uh, you know, I'm biased here, but I would, I would propose the symbol of the rock climber, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, and first of all, I would, I would, say, I would say that um, encouraging other people to propose their own symbols which is really like meta, you know, the meta level is like, well, we all have to propose our own symbols, but we have to unite those symbols into some sort of coherent uh, way forward, rather than just sort of holding these symbols in an unstable postmodernist uh, mm. relationship to each other, right? Mm. And so the rock climber, like, the rock climber really 
really wants to get to his aim, right? Like he has the same drive of the modernist of like, I will do this. Um, but if you ask him why, like, why do you go climbing? It's like, I don't know, I just do, like, I just like it. <laughs> I mean, like, why not? Because it's there is a famous answer to that question, right? Why do you want to climb that mountain? Because it's there, because it's rad, you know what I mean? Like, why not? Um, and so, so to me, that, that's the mindset of the, of the metamodernist is it's like, it's like, yeah, this isn't ultimately, like a rock climber knows that, you know, it's like eventually, I mean, I'm a rock climber, so it's like eventually I'm going to die. Eventually, like there's no final, there's no beating the game of rock climbing, right? I'm going to rock mm -hmm. climb until I either get too old and decrepit to do it or I just lose interest. But, but right now I'm interested and I'm stoked and like I'm going for it, right? And so like, don't get in my way. Um, and so that's, that's what I would propose as the metamodernist is he who, who takes postmodernism in stride but still strives to propose truth that can be used within the context that we currently live um, and uses dialectics this is the important point uh, that you would introduce here is, is uh, it's, a, it's a dialectical process between the, the postmodern deconstruction and the modernist construction, right? So it's like, I'm going to construct this truth, but then I'm going to deconstruct it and realize that it's not true. And by like going through that process, I can somehow have some sort of forward motion, right? And, and to me, like, you know, hearkening back to our last conversation, to me, the forward is the missing piece, right? right. For me, the metamodernists right now, they're engaging in the dialectic um, of postmodern deconstruction and modernist construction, but that it's a it's an oscillation is the word that I've used. Greg, uh, I've heard used. Greg Denver used this word. I've heard other people use this word. We oscillate between one and the other. And uh, my point here would be that oscillation is not forward movement, right? In order mm -hmm. to have constant forward progress, you need a way through the tension. You can't just oscillate within the tension. Um, and to me, that's when metamodernism will turn into metamodernity is when we establish a way through the tension so as to accomplish specific ends. Well, first off, Zach, um, I, I hope some university has you come in and do surveys on cultural criticism because that was one of the best overviews of that process I've ever heard. So <laughs> I, I salute you very much. You know, there was so much there. I think the way you described the movement from above below to objective and subjective is, is very well put. Um, I think that is a good way to define the movement from, say, romanticism or German idealism, uh, from searching for these sort of inner patterns or patterns in the world that would match with a above pattern, if you will, to this sort of divide between object and subject is very well put, um, which then leads into a modernist effort to, say, just emphasize the objective and to move away from the phenomenon to whatever the uh, the noumenon is or the noumena, if we use that uh, Kantian language, which I understand Kant complexifies in some way, but that effort for a totalizing system. I think you put it very well on this idea of modernity as a um, analytical formula. One is searching for an analytical process or an analytical formulation to, obt to obtain certainty. I think the word certainty is very good to talk about modernity, which we can associate with Descartes. Now, again, there's more to Descartes than that. I'm no uh, Descartes scholar, but generally this notion of how can we know anything? Well, we, the more we can emphasize and determine the objective, uh, which a lot of people say a Bertrand Russell or the analytical tradition moves in the direction of say, escaping language or searching for uh, these analytical processes. And then that uh, that very difficult uh, Kurt Girdle comes along and makes uh, makes everything so hard. I think what you said on post-modernity, um, you know, Derrida, uh, himself says that deconstruction is justice. Uh, you know, he has this notion that you're going to deconstruction is supposed to come from Heidegger's notion of creating a clearing so that you can construct something. I think Derrida himself intended for um, deconstruction to be clearing to make way for something. But here's the problem. Um, Postmodernity carried out this clearing in a manner that removed people of the internal resources to care to build anything. Uh, and so I do think the initial creators, because I think it's fair to associate deconstruction very closely with postmodernism. I mean, if we go into novels, I would say like a Thomas Pitchin would be a big example, a Bart fun, uh, Into the Fun House, this sort of self-referential text. But philosophically, uh, I think it is fair to say that postmodernity is mainly deconstruction because you, you can even view um, Foucault, 
Uh, I, I'm never, I, I guess Foucault's a post-structuralist. I always get, I always get confused uh, with uh, structuralism, post-structuralism, Leo Strauss and different things. And, you know, I, I, I guess I have to get up and leave now that I admit it, I can't keep those all together. But, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, Foucault has a deconstructive element uh, in so much that power tends to be narratives and we want to deconstruct those narratives in the same way that a leprechaun, you know, deconstruct these grand narratives for the sake of making a clearing so that individuals can come in and build something new, something more just, something more free. The problem that got postmodernity in trouble is precisely, as I said, in the process of making that clearing, it removed the internal or spiritual or whatever resources you want to say to make people care to do that. Um, and gradually what has occurred is postmodernism has unveiled that you cannot live on irony alone. You cannot live on bread alone. You cannot live on irony alone. Now, Mr. Denver, and we'll, we'll get more into Mr. Denver because I'm extremely grateful for the discussions I've had a chance to speak with. He, you know, we watched our first talk and, um, and there were many mistakes I was making. You know, for me, Liminal Web just kind of meant the, all the online communities that are having different discussions. And Liminal Web for me also, I associate a lot with Hegel because a lot of the discussions I was having with people involved the dialectic and Hegel. So it was very metamodern in the sense that Denver meant to me. Unfortunately, that's not at all what Liminal Web means. But Liminal Web has a much more game B association, complexity theory emergence, and silly old me using terms, not completely sure on what that what that means. So I mean, Mr. Denver was correct on that confusion that was that was caused. And also, I had used um, meta modern to refer to the period after postmodernity, when it would assume that one in doing so that would assume that you can define an age by its most unique and innovative new cultural movement, as opposed to its structure. And I think Mr. Denver is correct that we are still a postmodern structure. We're still in postmodernity or even hypermodernity, which is intense postmodernism per se. Um, and that there is metamodernism occurring in reaction to hypermodernity and the culture of postmodernism, but we are yet to have metamodernity. And I think if we were to ask what is the question of metamodern pragmatism, it is the question of how does metamodernism uh, become metamodernity? And what does that even look like? What would the nature of those structures be? And things like that. So I'm very grateful uh, for Mr. Denver. And to Mr. Denver's defense, you know, something he was saying with Mr. Pascal on the integral stage is that whenever you lose a term, you, you, you lose a kind of hold on the world, right? Um, I always, you know, Wittgenstein has that line where he says the limits of my um, language are the limits of my world. That always meant to me as well that the expressions of my language are the expressions of my world. And if I lose language, I lose world. And so, you know, if, if metamodern just comes to being um, synthesis, integral, the, the point that he's making, these kind of emergence, these kind of terms, then there's a hold, a kind of grip that one loses on the on the world. And that grip might be extremely important if indeed a dialectic or an oscillation is ultimately the way forward. Maybe it's not, right? Maybe, maybe it is something that's more uh, emergent or game B or different things, but you're not even gonna even have the ability to, to get a grip on that concept of the dialectic, which I do think is the philosophical equivalence of the cultural oscillation. Um, I, you know, one of the issues too that has happened is I'm always using dialectic as I understand it from the philosophy of Black series or my reading of Hegel, which is not a synthesis. You know, there is no ultimate synthesis. It's a, it is kind of an oscillation. But of course, the problem is every time I use that for people who are used to dialectic, meaning thesis, antithesis, synthesis, that does sound like liminal web talk. Uh, when for me, it is different. So it, I think this is, uh, I've really appreciated Mr. Denver to help sort of sort through the, through all that and to help me think about it as well. But to get back on the, um, the uh, what we were saying about modernism, postmodernism. So what has happened is postmodernism has gotten to the place and then hypermodernity by extension, where irony can always ironize irony. And I'm also going to focus, I am going to focus on the particular polarity of sincerity versus irony. There are other polarities that Mr. Denver will stress, naivety and knowingness, um, melancholy and hope. You know, there are these different ones, but I'm going to just focus on sincerity and irony because I believe those are the most kind of vivid. Uh, that's the most vivid polarity that comes to people's mind when they think about metamodernity. And also, I think it, it's kind of um, it, the logic will apply just as well to the other polarities. And rather than go through every single one of them every single time, I'll just focus on irony and sincerity.
Um, what ends up happening is eventually postmodernism has come to the realization that irony can always ironize irony and irony and irony. Kierkegaard mentions the infinite absolute negation, actually inspired by Hegel. And that, as I understand it, is the idea that irony always leads to more irony, to more irony and more irony. And so he's like, that's a problem because that's ultimately just going to eat everything, right? You know, you're eventually going, he'll, you know, you, you can't live that way. And so there's a sense in which post postmodernity has come to the place where it has started to realize that you can't live on autonomous irony. But modernity is where you realize you can't live on, you know, postmodernity reacted to modernity because it realized you can't live on autonomous rationality. So you can't have just rationality, but you also can't have just irony. And likewise, you can't have just irony um, because you eventually deconstruct, but you also don't want to have autonomous sincerity because then you get taken advantage of, right? You know, if you're like sincerely following the capitalist uh, project, you end up in uh, corporatism. The sincerely following the uh, communist project, you end up in Stalinism. There's this notion that sincerity is dangerous, right? Well, there's also a danger in irony. So what ends up happening is a need to, to move between. I, I really like also what you were saying about art, how it, you know, it used to mean skill, like more so the skill and the person who did art, where in modernity art became an object. Because to me, when we talk about the oscillation, that is a, that, so much of that is skill, dialectic, oscillation. This is all very skill-based. There's a sense in which metamodernism is a realization of a need to re-emphasize a kind of art of being, a kind of art form of being, which, you know, goes with the becoming that we talk about in Hegel, um, which, you know, what does that mean? One has to unpack because it's not purely a, a, a groundless process, but there's a, there's a kind of skill, a kind of art form that you will to the becoming. Um, but it would seem that, before I give it back to you, that one of the realizations of metamodernism in order to practice it, to realize it into structure, it seems to have something to do with an ability to handle a certain skill, to enact a certain art, where we'll no longer do to say, find an ideological object, you know, like an art as object, it no longer does, it no longer will do to have the right ideas that you can kind of make external to the subject and place outside of you and then get everyone to join your political party or church or whatever, and then we're all going to be saved. No, it's like a return to the realization that no art is a skill. Ideas and ideology are a skill. You know, we all have ideology. We can't escape ideology. Worldview, I, you know, I think Zizek is right on that. But it's the question of we now are having to engage in skill some kind of skill, which then requires a conditioning to do the skill and to handle the skill. So I think the language of something like rock climber is very, very good. Because indeed, the rock climber is the rock climber in the act, in the doing. And I love what you said, because it's there, you know, because we're here, because we're human, because we cannot live on irony alone, because we cannot live on sincerity alone, we have to have a certain action. Um, that brings to mind some of the thinking of Daniel Frege and ontol ontological design, where he emphasizes this kind of skill, this kind of movement, and that would be in a, a different conversation. But it does seem to be, um, if we want to talk about meta-modern meta philosophy, which um, would be this more Hegelian dialectical philosophy, I don't think it would necessarily be an emergent philosophy. And I do agree also with Mr. Dimber that the majority of metamodernism at this point is more of an aesthetic response. It is not the predominant philosophical discussion, even if, uh, you know, in the little corner of the internet that uh, we occupy, you know, dialectic might be something we talk about. But a, a metamodern um, philosophy seems to have a very interesting um, emphasis on skill, on art, on practice on action you know i go between these different terms and that seems to be a unique facet of it well hey i thought that was that was great i i totally agree with everything you said um let me ask you a question about hegel because i've never read hegel mm -hmm. um and like there's a lot of confusion about this language of thesis antithesis synthesis versus like whatever <laughs> whatever language Hegel was using, I don't even know. Sure. Um, and like I've used that language before, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and I've had that same insight of like, well, there's like synthesis seems to think that you're done, right? And like you're not done, but they're like the word I use is resolution, right? Mm. Like it, for music, you know, I mean, there's tension and then it resolves. And so like there is like in resolution, there is a, there is a finality to it, but as soon as you start playing another note, immediately there's tension again. Right. So like right. it doesn't do away with it forever. And like, 
So, so just kind of run me through like Hegel's language here, because and like maybe maybe we could use a, a tangible example. So, um, like a dialectic tension that I face often is the tension between um, benefit and weight. Like, so I'm, I've I've done a lot of uh, hiking, like long distance hiking, right? And so when I'm making choices about what gear I'm going to take, there's always this tension of like. Well, if I take this thing, it would be really useful, but if I don't, but then if I take it, then I have to carry it, right? And it's, it weighs something and that's gonna weigh me down and encumber me. And so there's, on the one hand, I wanna be prepared. On the other hand, I wanna be unencumbered. And um, every decision I make is, is I would say, is, a re is uh, an attempt to resolve that tension in the particular, right? Mm. And so it's like, well, I have this tension, you know, what socks am I gonna take? Well, there's this tension. Okay, I'm gonna take these socks. Right? I was like, okay, now what jacket am I going to take? And again, the tension comes back and it's like, well, I'm going to take this jacket. And that resolves the tension in that particular instance, but then the, like, it doesn't resolve it forever. Right. And so I would use, I would use that language of, of uh, tension and resolution, but Hegel seems to use some like, I don't know if there's negation or a uh, actualization, like what, give me the language here. Give me the language. No, that, that's outstanding. Um, you know, there's a few things. Um, so the main triad, if, if you will, with Hegel is going to be um, abstraction, negation, concretion. So you have an abstract idea, for example, you negate the abstraction by making it concrete. But the only way that that concretion has meaning is in light of the abstraction of which made it arise. So there's a kind of tension. Um, and there's always a tension. So even, so the main word that people will use to describe um, Hegel would be like contradiction, becoming. These are, these are key terms. But the issue is, even with becoming, it's very interesting because you almost need to put, as I understand it, you need to put the, the B in parentheses because the becoming is always, as you're becoming, you're also kind of concrete in a feeling or a kind of state of, of being. You are understood to others as being. You understand yourself as being, and, you, and yet you are also becoming. Uh, so there's this weird, by contradiction, um, Hegel does not mean a sort of like a faced out of like existence contradiction, but contradiction as a kind of tension of which because it is tension has to move. One could use a term like paradox. Dr. McGowan will kind of complexify this. He'll talk about its becoming. Um, one of the reasons, though, that it's easy to get a sense of synthesis from Hegel is one, we read Hegel through Marx, and Marx is going to have the material dialectic give rise to a universal class of which transcends class warfare, so that feels like a kind of synthesis. And that then um, also, it's easy to read the elements of the philosophy of the right as a development through history of greater synthesis, when really what is being described is, a, is, um, is not that all the parts of society kind of join together, but that more and more people come under the same umbrella is what I like to describe. Now, if we follow the elements of the philosophy of the right, coming under the same umbrella sure does sound like and seem like a kind of synthesis, but really the parts don't necessarily synthesize. In fact, there could be more tension and difficulty as you bring difference under the same umbrella. So there can be a conflation of putting under the same um, umbrella with synthesization. When really what's interesting following Hegel there is that as indeed the global state moves toward, you know, the state of nature moves into family, which moves into community, which moves into state, which moves into commerce. And there is indeed greater and greater people coming under more and more of an umbrella. But actually the tension gets greater and greater as you go along. It's not actually, difference becomes more pronounced. It's not necessarily the tension goes away, um, which the term synthesis makes it sound like tension goes away. And that's the great misreading that kind of emerges in Hegel. You have maybe greater and greater again, to, uh, to put a point again, you could argue that there's a sense of more people under an umbrella, but that doesn't mean there's less tension. That's kind of the, the, the conflict, or that difference goes away. There's greater relation between greater difference, but the difference is always there, which leads, which leads attention. So the dialectic, what ends up happening is the dialectic, dialectical logic and dialectical thinking becomes necessary for difference to sustain the feeling of, dif of being different so that it actually does not explode. So that it does not lead to, say, effacement or, or conflict or, or different trouble. Um, one of the reasons, um, so another thing I'll say is that the elements of the philosophy of the right emerge out of the great tension of 
a human being born, coming into existence, feeling like they ought to be absolutely free and able to do anything, and yet they, they suffer necessity. They're in a certain body. They're not able to fly. They can't have any parents they want. Like you're immediately conflicted with necessity, which creates a certain pathological neurotic tension because you feel like you should be free, but you're not. That's the condition you start in. Well, as I read the elements of the philosophy of the right, there becomes the kind of idea of how does the state develop, not just state by government. I think we need to read state in the philosophy of the right as the state of nature of which manifests into government, but it is the development of the state of nature through time. So it becomes an issue of how does the state manage the individual so that that neurosis, that tense situation they find themselves starting in doesn't overload them, like doesn't lead to conflict. How do you, how do you make people comfortable with the fact that they can't do anything they want to do and okay with it, right? How do you get them to the place? Well, the state provides money. Well, the state provides law. Well, the state provides commerce. So the state does things to make the feeling of confronting necessity bearable, you can say, okay? But, but, the, but the tension is always there. This is the point. In Hegel, there, the state develops to make the unescapable tension bearable, not to make it go away. But you see, this is... The brain, the, the reader, literally the reader of the brain themselves, the brain naturally thinks in terms of getting rid of tension. It wants to get rid of tension. It hates tension. So it is very natural for the brain to interpret what Hegel is saying as a removal of tension, as synthesis being a removal of tension, because that's what the brain naturally seeks. And indeed, that does seem to be what Hegel is saying. You know, it's not like, I think Todd McGowan is correct that Hegel is like Freud before Freud. I think he is also dealing, you know, Mr. Ebert is doing work on the mathematics of Hegel and he wants to talk about how Hegel in the science of logic is talking about like logical concepts that there's not even the mathematics for yet. So it's really difficult to put into words. So I think that's all very true. I think what Mr. Ebert is doing is, is magnificent. Um, and you see what ends up happening is therefore Hegel uses a wording to talk about Freud before Freud or to talk about set theory before set theory, uh, to talk about all these different things and in indeterminacy before that language is there. And thus it is difficult and that creates space for the brain to interpret it as it wants to interpret it, which is the removal of difference and the removal of tension. And so it becomes very natural then and um, understandable to create the sorthand phrase to refer to Hegel as thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That's just a very natural and believable um, reading of Hegel, given the condition of his different writings. And once that starts, it becomes a meme, it spreads, all the other brains on planet Earth likes it. And indeed, as a mental model, it's not all bad. There's some use to the mental model of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Because indeed, I think emotions certainly operate that way. I put that in a short Substack article on how emotionally we tend to confront an antithesis. And until we emotionally feel like the thesis and antithesis of an issue like gun rights or whatever, until we feel like there's a synthesis, we emotionally are not comforted. So indeed, there's something about emotions, I think, actually follow a thesis, antithesis, synthesis structure. But if we're talking about the, the, the development of the state and the development of people with difference, that, that would not describe what Hegel wants to do. He wants to describe greater and greater umbrella of which increases greater and greater difficulty of the state to figure out how to manage that tension so that it doesn't explode. But Hegel also wants to propose that if you if we do manage to figure it out, there will be actually, it's almost like things do get better. There is a progress to Hegel, but it's a contingent progress. If we do manage to learn to handle greater and greater difference and greater and greater um, pathological trouble, if we learn to oscillate between difference, learn to carry out all of the metamodern skills that we're describing, then the, then the world to come will be better than the world to the past. Um, it's just not necessary. Hegel's, the other problem is that Marx read a determinism into Hegel. There's a determinism to Marx. And that also, and once you take determinism, add it to a notion of greater and greater umbrella and add that with a sense of progress, well, it almost would have to be a synthesis, right? You know, if you read that into Hegel, synthesis is the only logical way to put all those elements together. Because if the world is determined to get better, well, the only way the world gets better is if people get along, therefore you unify, therefore Hegel must be talking about synthesis. You see what ends up happening. Once you read a determinism, once you read a necessary progress into Hegel, 
then a notion of a unifying synthesis becomes just rational. That just is what everything would have to rationally lead to if, if that's what Hegel is saying. The issue is that that's not what Hegel is saying. It is not determined. It is a contingent progress. If there is a future, then yes, it is better than the past, but there's no guarantee that there's a future. So I think Marx is the main... Now, rather, Marx is correct about other issues and is a good thinker in other issues, um, that's an entirely different subject. And just because I do think Marx misread Hegel, that does not mean that Marx is wrong. You can have a right misreading, uh, you know, so that's an entirely different subject on where is Marx right and where he is wrong. So don't take this as necessarily bashing Marx. I do have things to say about Marx. I think his material dialectic is incomplete because he needs to include a class that create the means of production called that I like to call the artifacts, but that's another conversation. But I would say that that would be the main reason there is this popular notion of thesis, antithesis, synthesis that has gotten in the way of seeing Hegel as actually having in a, a essential a difference that is a dialectic that leads to an oscillation that would, funny enough, align Hegel with metamodernism, even though a lot of the Hegelians online tend to be very critical of the metamodern groups that, you know, that people who call themselves metamodern online. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me let me see. Let me try and give some of that back to you if I understood. Um, it, it seems to me that what you're saying is that Hegel is proposing, um, kind of he's, he's laying out how a state could exist uh, that unites many people, but without trying to smash them all into one yes. category, right? So it's like you and I, maybe we disagree about what you know, gun rights. You know, I'm sure. You're, you're pro gun, I'm in, whatever, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking sure, a stance, sure. but um, for the sake of argument, we disagree on gun rights, but Hegel is proposing that through a dialectical process, we could still live together and um, somehow, like, I guess this is, this is my question, this is what I still don't understand, is it's like, I, you know, say, let's just say I'm pro gun and you're anti gun, right? And it's like, okay, at the end of the day, though, like, we have to set a law somewhere, sure. right? And so, like, how does that, to me, that would be, like, I would call that a resolution. Um, it's like, there's this tension between us, and we resolve that tension by putting a specific law into place that somehow satisfies, hopefully satisfies both of them. Maybe it doesn't, you know what I mean? Maybe it mm. pisses you off or pisses me off, but um, that's, like, that tension calls forth a particular action. And so, I guess, in Hegel, that would be the the particular action, like the, the abstraction would be like, we need to do something about guns. The negation would be, uh, you know, let's do this particular thing about guns. And then the concretization would be like the actual uh, implementation of that law. Am I getting that right? That's a very fair way to put it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, Okay. Okay. Good. I'm just. I'm just trying to. Get no. Just, well, just, you're asking a million dollar question. Um, this is why the paper. So Hegel in the Elements of the Philosophy of Right, um, indeed has a section on law, contract, um, and he goes section by section, providing reason for um, the person who confronts the modern law to not assume that it is therefore delegitimate. The name of the paper that I do, because you're asking a really big question. Um, I think a lot of people on the Zizekian side of Hegel like to talk about the phenomenology of spirit and even the science of logic. A lot of times people don't know what to do with the elements of the philosophy of the right or the philosophy of nature. These things are kind of de-emphasized in, in the Zizekian talk, whereas people who are more Marxist in their Hegelian reading or maybe more of a modernist in their thinking are going to emphasize the elements of the philosophy of right. Uh, the way I take the elements of the philosophy of right is uh, the title of the paper is Hegel justifies Hegel, the Hegel's justification of Hegel, which we view the elements of the philosophy of right as giving us reason to assume, but not with certainty, but to have as a starting place that whatever the historic moment is right now, we have reason to assume that it is where we should start our thinking, as opposed to wonder if we should go back to a thousand years in the past. Because what Hegel actually understood is if you can't assume that right now is where thinking should begin, then thinking can never begin. Because you can always say that it was better 20 years ago, it was better a thousand years ago, or it would be better if we got rid of X, Y, and Z. So you actually end up in the kind of postmodern infinite deconstruction. If you can't Assume the, if you cannot find good reason to assume the now, 
well, then thinking is over. And so Hegel is trying to provide an argument for the justification of assuming the now so that thinking can begin to perhaps negate the now into a different now. Uh, he's not against any, he's not a like traditionalist saying that whatever now is, is what we should preserve. He's saying that now must be where we begin thinking because otherwise thinking will never have a foundation and will just infinitely explode. You know, in a sense, a way you could put it, if Descartes wants to start with the I, you know, the I, I think, therefore I am, in a way you could say Hegel wants to start with the now, with the historic moment as the beginning of thinking. But you see, so, but you see, that makes space for debate, but not a deconstruction of the grounds of that debate, okay? So you, he's given you the now as a ground. On that ground, there could be a dialectical process of which can always reconstitute itself. So for example, let's say that I, um, we pass a law that says everyone in America can buy us, you know, assault weapons or whatever. That's like a law that is passed, whatever. So Hegel would say, okay, rather than say, start your thinking claiming that the Supreme Court was evil when it passed that law in say 2016, if I were to make up a scenario, instead start your thinking from the place of what does the law say? about the assault rifle. Why is it good or why is it bad? What has happened in the now to the state with the development of that? And should that be negated into a different concretion or should it not be? And to actually be doing with the concrete to sort of determine. What ends up happening is, although to use what the language you were saying, there's a resolution, the resolution is always contingent upon the present dialectical process. It can be reconstituted. It cannot be, you must assume the ground on which the resolution rests, but the resolution itself can be reconstituted. This is a very kind of strange doubleness that Hegel is trying to pull, but I actually think it's really important because if the brain feels like things are too solid, it becomes hopeless, just like modernism or totalitarian. But if the brain feels like things are too fluffy or baseless, you fall into post-modernity. So Hegel, in my mind, and it's in it, I, I think the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers are similar. He is indefinitely trying to strike a kind of meta, it's funny to say, a kind of meta-modern oscillation, even though it's going to be using the language of, of dialectic. Um, and the other move that that therefore makes, if you must assume the now, is if you, so you have your country where assault rifles are allowed, you have your dialectical process, and, and let's say it's overturned. You decide that, no, we're not going to have everyone have assault rifles now. Hegel says, oh, by the way, you now have to assume this now is legitimate. So the result is justified as well. You see, you can't then just say this was a bad result and we shouldn't have never done it. No, no, no. It was just constituted into your new ground. So if you want to negate it, you will have to deal with it on its own terms of being the new ground. You see what's going on. Yeah. So this is really important because you always have to be thinking the now, which gives you a solid foundation, but it's also not so hard that it turns into a kind of modernist totalitarianism. So, and I think that actually is much more, the genius of that is that actually, I do think for the citizenship that becomes more psychologically tenable. Like you can live with the result. It, it, it has this, it's this middle ground in Hegel supporting the French Revolution, but then also be critical of the French Revolution. How do you find the middle between the revolution that takes on corruption, but then the revolution that overturns the institutions without any idea of what to, um, of what to replace it with? And then you fall into Napoleon, right? That's always the tension. Well, Hegel is presenting a kind of philosophy that is a kind of middle, dare I say, although middle is a dangerous term, between a, 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 a traditionalist revolution, you know, putting these things together so you don't go too far in one direction or the other. Okay, okay, that made a lot of sense. Thank you for explaining that. Um, so like, just to, just to make sure I, I understand it, um, Hegel is different than, like the, I guess the, the modernist analyst would say something like, there is a right way to handle gun law. And like, we can write the perfect law. And once we do that, it's over. Whereas Hegel would say, um, we, can, we can come up with a better law for this context than we currently have. Um, and in order to do that, we have to engage in this dialectical process. But as soon as we do that, don't go thinking that, that it's over because the context will inevitably change. And once it does, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to uh, redo the whole process for this context. That, that's actually a brilliant way to put it. Um, because like, for example, 
If I were to say to you in a vacuum, every American should have assault rifles, you might like throw up and be like, that's the worst thing ever. But if I were to say every American should have assault rifles because the Nazis are invading, well, suddenly you might go, yeah, everyone should have an assault rifle. So that's what Hegel is leaving open. He's like, the now uh, is what you must think from. And, and I think using that language of context is really good there, Hyrule. I really like that. Well, yeah, and that like that that makes a lot of sense. Like, I, I easily translate that into the the backpacking gear uh, analogy, where it's like I'm I'm choosing gear for this particular trip, right? Like, I'm I'm going. I wouldn't take the same gear to the mountains as I would to the desert, right? And so I have to. It's like I can say this is the right gear for this mountain range at this time, given my particular skill set and mm. the weather and all of that. But when I go to the desert, I can't go thinking that the same gear is going to work. I have to rethink the whole, I have to go through this whole dialectical process of burden and benefit again, because the context is different. And so the, the selecting principle that tells me where to be within this oscillation has changed. Um, that, that's excellent. And that, and that makes me think about maybe there's a need for language like philosophical gear. Uh, because, you know, a lot of time we talk about epistemology, mental models, which I think is getting at something like gear. It certainly has been for me, but I have not thought about metaphorically the idea of philosophical gear, like um, you know, because that's what we're describing. And, and Hegel is basically saying relative to the now determines your philosophical gear. Uh, and you cannot say what Hegel is basically saying is don't you don't want to say you never should support every American having assault rifles. Maybe history develops in a manner where there is never a moment where every American should have an assault rifle. Maybe that's how history goes. But you cannot say with certainty that history will go that way because it's possible the Nazis invade. It's possible that there is a situation where every American having an assault rifle is the way that you fight off the Nazis, right? Maybe that never manifests, but you cannot say that it won't manifest, and therefore you must always think the now. Um, and that, I think, aligns very well with philosophical gear. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about when we talk about metamodern pragmatism is this kind of shift to metaphors like gear like rock climbing. You know, the other term I have been thinking about, well, because it has to, if we're talking an oscillation, if we are talking a dialectic, which I use those terms interchangeably, I understand there might be variation, but I think the philosophical equivalence of the cultural oscillation is the dialectic following what we are describing. That all said, what we are describing is a shift to thinking in terms of gear, to rock climbing. And even the word, when I think about pragmatism, I, I'm wondering, if almost the word is metamodern action. And the reason I say action is because that makes me think of a thinker that no, um, I read him in 2015 because Dr. Sadler mentioned him. It's a book called Action by Marchese Blondel. I read it in 2015. And my friend Javier wants to have a talk with Trey on, um, on, a, on a Boober, Martin Boober's I and Thou. And I was going through my bookshelf and I was like, oh, I remember Blondel's action. I haven't read that forever. So I picked it up last week and I was like, Oh, this is that book I think is genius, but I need to like go back and reread it because I think there's a lot of gems here that I don't know about. Um, and what he talks about is the difference between like pragmatism and action, where action is more of the, he kind of thinks that action is the linchpin that makes philosophy possible. Like it is the intelligibility of philosophy. And he wants to say that it's different from pragmatism. And he kind of talked with William James. He knew William James. And actually there was a point where Blondell talked about action as if it was pragmatism. But then he found out that pragmatism basically determined truth by use. You know, use is a big thing. You know, if you can use it, if it works, then it is, then it might as well be true or that it is practically true. And Blondell was like, uh, let me think about that. Not so sure if I want to use the term pragmatism anymore. And so, but, but basically for him, action, philosophy is inherently action because action is the linchpin, you could say, between the meta and the physical. Uh, you know, it is what makes intelligibility possible. It is the response to the, he starts off the book talking about, like Hegel, the dialectic between necessity and freedom. Like you find yourself in necessity. How do you act in response to that? The moment you ask that question, how do I respond? How do I act relative to the necessity, determinations, the things I do not control that I find myself presented with, thrown into, to use Heidegger's language, how do I respond? Well, now you're talking about action. And now you're talking about philosophy. You can't escape it. 
And so there's a sense in what's happened with metamodernism is to me, if I'm reading Blondell correctly, who again is one of those geniuses that I'm like, it's just interesting because you forget it. Like I think Austin Farah is another example and you know that get forgotten for whatever reason. Um, but Blondell seems to actually be uh, in this camp talking about action as defend as kind of a distinction from pragmatism. Now I'm not, I love the term pragmatism. I'm going to use it. I think it, you know, practice and different things, but it's interesting to think about action as distinct from pragmatism and different things. Well, yeah, that's, that's really good. Cause I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not fully comfortable using the word pragmatism, mostly just because I don't know exactly what it means. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that pragmatism like refers to a whole group of philosophers who have written books and, and oh, yeah. laid out the whole uh, metaphysical scheme. And like, I don't know, I don't even know who the, the pragmatists are. So like- Well, this is uh, what- I, now, I don't want to get to tied into something that I don't, I don't actually believe. Well, for me, pragmatism is um, Peirce, you know, CP, I really think Peirce was a super genius. Um, but I prefer, you know, pragmatism for a lot of people means Richard Rortery. I, I'm not sure what I think about Rortery. I read his books, but I much prefer Peirce. And then, of course, William James. But then it comes to mean, you know, pragmatism comes to be like use. You know, that is what it means. And that's why I talk about that phenomenon. I talk about phenomenological pragmatism, which, which feels better. But I'm starting to think I, I'm going to read action again a lot better. I think action that Blondell's talking about is probably closer to what I like. I like action because we all know what action means. Right? <laughs> That's very simple. Um, and I don't know, when I, like, my understanding of fragments, there seems to be this move where they try and get an ought from an is, right? They seem to say, like, well, everything is pragmatic. Like, to me, pragmatic thinking just means that you're thinking towards a goal, right? You're thinking so as to accomplish some tangible thing in the world. Um, and I feel like the pragmatists try and say, like, well, if we just say that our, our ultimate goal is something like, the well-being of everyone all the time, always, then we can just have pragmatic thinking from there, right? And we don't have to turn up and open out of our frame and receive insight from something above us, right? Um, but again, I don't know, I don't know. I like, I like this term of action, because that to me, like coming back to what, what we were talking about, about dialectics is that uh, like that, okay, so, given that there is a dialectic tension between, for example, benefit and burden within a, a backpacking context, um, I and backpacker B, backpacker A and backpacker B will, will face that same tension, but they will resolve it differently, right? We'll, we'll look at the same, you know, we'll go to the same stores and do the same research on the internet, but I'll be like, hey, I'm going to take this gear, and he'll say, I'm going to take this gear, and I, neither one of us can say the other one is wrong, it's just that we've taken different actions within that tension, right? And so to me, ultimately, like every philosophy, everything is about developing a way to move through that action, right? Like I have, a, I've developed as a backpacker, I've developed a way to choose my gear. And that goes, that goes to how I do research, you know, like how much money I'm willing to spend in different places, because these are all tensions, right? It's like, well, I could spend money on this new jacket, but then I won't have as much money for food and stuff, you know what I mean? So like, do I want this new jacket or do I want to spend another three weeks hiking? You know, it's like, right. I don't know. And, and different people will, will choose different actions within that tension, right? And, and what action you choose is not, like, you can't reduce it. You can't just say, like, well, you set up the tension and then action just kind of happens, right? right. Like, no, you have to develop, an, I would say, an embodied way. Like, I think that the way that you move through attention ultimately resides in your physical body. You know, it's like, it's a fee, it's like an urge. It's a, it's like a, okay, here's the tension and I'm going here. Like, this is my move. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it's not reducible down to another principle. It's, it's right. because that principle will always be in a dialectic tension with some other principle. And so, so I like, I like that language of action. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, I mean, Marcy, you know, Blondell is a thinker who, whenever I go, I've always felt like, um, like I mentioned, I think Balthasar and the theologians, um, Austin Farah, Blondell, um, Vico, you know, those are four things. And I also, there's another man who wrote a book called Personal Knowledge, uh, Ponte, uh, well, you got, you know, obviously a phenomenology of perception, uh, Ponye, uh, who's a great mind. There are a few that I'm like, and Benjamin Fondaine, who I did with Davout, I'm like, oh my gosh, how did I not know about this guy? There are a few thinkers who I think are a really, really big deal that are not in the discussion. 
very much. And it's like, oh, well, you should go do the paper on them. And there's not enough time in the day. But but for Mr. Blondell on action, which again, maybe we'll call this talk meta modern action instead of meta modern pragmatism. We'll just keep moving and we'll see where we end up. But I do that think would, action, would, yeah, yeah. you know, I think action too as the kind of linchpin that makes philosophy possible. Because Blondell is going to say like the following, like at, there would be no philosophy if there was no action. Uh, you would just be in your moment, right? Like if you were just in your moment and action for him inherently entails a kind of contingent time. It, it's not merely passing through time, but it is the will manifesting through time. So there's agency in action that is not merely being because there is a becoming in action, right? He almost wants to talk about action as becoming or the becoming like with the BE in parentheses kind of thing. Also, I think what Blondell is talking about with action fits very well with say the phenomenological journey that Dr. Last will talk about with Hegel, where you have these stages of consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, spirit, you know, you, you know, where you go into religion, spirit, religion, absolute knowing, you have this kind of movement, there's a kind of action that is developing through Hegel, it, I think with Hume, it works very well on the return to common life. So I think the principle of action, and, and it is, I think, the issue with the term pragmatism is that it doesn't, it, it does not necessarily capture this notion of the embodiment of the metaphysical, of which Blondell really wants to put forth. You know, you could almost say that for Blondell, as I understand it, metaphysics is, and I use this term, I, this is how I think, that metaphysics is always meta in parentheses. That it is, the meta is not separate from the physical, but is the reference, pens, it is the, re, it is physical folding on physical, referencing physical to make intelligibility possible. And for Blondell, that is action. Action always entails a kind of physical referencing itself through time in the manner that it will carry itself through time to be what it so wills. So there's a reference through time that is occurring that must be philosophy. You cannot find this in an empirical process. You cannot study this in a lab. You cannot call this anything but philosophy. And basically what's funny is Blondell's like, hey, Philosophy really started to get really bad in quality once we removed action from consideration. And he's like, and the last one to do that was basically Aristotle. Aristotle cared about action and then we forgot about it. And we talked a lot about being. Uh, and he's like, being's fine. That's okay. I don't, you know, we can talk about that, but you know, action's kind of a big deal. And, um, and, and it was forgotten as a concept. And actually, I think Blondell would look back and say, well, Pragmatism was kind of close, but unfortunately, the concept of action was um, consumed by pragmatism and lost as being the unique metaphysical principle, uh, which I think is what you kind of need to bring back. So I think action probably is a better term if we mean it in the kind of Blondell sense uh, than pragmatism. Yeah, and I think that I think that action, uh, like. What, everything we're talking about here, it, it makes a critique of modernism, which doesn't fall into the postmodern trap. Yes. Like, like you can't, you can't analyze your way into the right backpack again. You know what I mean? Right. Like you, just, you have to try it and then, and then be cold and then be like, okay, next time, you know, I should err more on this side, right? Because I took this action and the world responded in a certain way, and now I need to adjust my course, right? Like, you can't, you can't just analyze it. Like, you really do have to live it out and try it, and then, and then re-engage in the dialectical process, make adjustments, and then try it again, right? So I do think that action, uh, it provides, like, a, a, a more solid ground of epistemology than the postmodernists, but without falling into the certainty of the, of the modernist trap. That, yeah. That, that oh, sense. yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that's what Blondell would say. And what's interesting, too, before I forget, he makes a kind of distinction. This sounds really weird, but I actually think it's pretty fascinating. He makes a distinction between act and action, where he says that one of the reasons why the philosophy of action has been lost is because people merely think in terms of act of act. And what he means by that, I equate to something very similar to what Heidegger is trying to do when he makes Dasein not be another subject. You know, Dasein is not merely a subject, like in the analytical sense. Dasein is the being for whom being is a question. And yeah, Heidegger is gonna go through moods. He's gonna go through existential concerns, but that's, that's in order to clear aside the subject, to analyze the being of whom being is a question, to then move that being aside so that being itself 
can sign through. So there's a kind of bracketing out that is occurring, even though he dismissed phenomenology, there is a kind of phenomenological bracketing out, a bracketing, a method that's similar to, to Herschel. In an interesting way, Blondell almost, in order for us to almost get the mystery, and I almost want to say suchness of action, he wants us to think about action independent of a subject just doing an act. Because often we just think about like, oh, I picked up a pen. Oh, I went to the store today. Oh, I did all these acts. And what's interesting is he says, yes, of course there is act in action, but actually we're acting all the time and lost sight of the mystery and majesty of action. And the richness of action has been lost. Now, of course, uh, you know, he's not going to throw you against the wall and say, don't use the word act. But it's interesting because in the same way that like Heidegger is like, oh, we're so concerned with beings, with the S, that we've lost being. Blondell's almost seemingly engaging in a project of saying we, we're so busy in acts and thinking about acts that we don't pay attention to action. And if we paid attention to action itself as the connecting principle of idea in physics and being with the world, that you would start to realize that it is utterly necessary for, for philosophy to even be possible. In the same way that Heidegger is like, philosophy died because being stopped being a question. It's almost like Blondell's like, nah, philosophy died because action stopped being a question. That's what went wrong. Uh, and I really find that very compelling because indeed action seems to be what metamodernism meta has realized is a necessary component. And also a take on Hegel is that an action through the phenomenological journey and in Nietzsche, as Dr. Last is teaching on, action is a really critical role. Um, it would seem that Blondell is like, yeah, no, nah, we forgot about action. And as a result, philosophy died. It's not because we lost sight of being, although that's closer, Heidegger. I don't think he was against that. Uh, but he's like, but actually it's action that has been lost, that has killed philosophy. Okay, so I think I understand. Let me just make sure, though, like the between the act and the action. Like, what the act is like? I'm, I'm actually, I'm picking up this cup. Um, would you say the action is like the, the process which uh, facilitates the act, or something like that? Is like yeah, a, no, it's a very good question. Like metaphysical uh, sort of like inspiration to move that the whole the whole way by which metaphysical inspiration comes down into the body and it, and then actually moves physical atoms around that's that the action and then the act is the like the result of that like the final result is that it, like, it's a really good question um because acts are there's almost something about acts that is kind of the thoughtless going through the day just doing acts doing goals it's almost like the distinction between goals and purpose you know, people have goals that they want to, but there's not like an underlying purpose to it all. So for like, you could say with Blondell, he's like, yeah, of course, everyone's always doing acts, but they never kind of, it doesn't connect into an action. You could almost say it's not part of a meet. You could even, I think, talk about meaning, frankly. It'd be like yeah. the acts do not connect into any kind of action. Uh, you know, they don't kind of, they're not, there's nothing connecting them. There's no overarching kind of metaphysical principle that holds the acts together into any sort of um, philosophy. Uh, yeah, and, and movement might be a might be a useful word here, like a because we could talk about like a philosophical movement, a social movement yes. as like a it's many acts brought together into a single purpose in as, in the language you're using. That that would be a good way to think. I don't think Blondell. I you know uh, yeah, again yeah. this. This is the book I read in 2015 that I've gotten to page 100 in the last few weeks. And I'm like, man, this is a rich book. Um, I think Blondell would be perfectly fine with the notion of saying something like, people today do a lot of acts, but they never move. You know, people today do a lot of acts, but they never move. Uh, would be kind of the sort of language. And I think you see that, like people, you know, if we're talking the meaning crisis language, people have a, have a lot of goals, but they don't have any meaning right? Because meaning is a kind of deeper way. But you see, this, so for Blondell, the problem is the loss of action. He's like, all right, you philosophers, you're talking about the meaning of life. But if it doesn't translate into action, it's nothing. You know, it, it's literally nothing. Like, it's like literally nothing. Like action, there is no meaning without action. And also, he almost wants to flip it around and say meaning is action. Like if, you're, if, you, if, if meaning does not translate into action, it is not itself. Yeah. And so for him, the loss of action. So basically what that means, what's so interesting about Blondell, um, and I've heard Dr. Sadler mention this, and I think it's correct. Basically, Blondell is saying, hey, 
If philosophy doesn't translate into action, it deconstructs. Deconstruction is all it can turn into. Uh, there is definitely, Dr. Sadler is correct, there is definitely Derrida in, Ma in Martin Blondell. What's kind of crazy about Blondell, if I, in reading it, is I think he's basically like, yeah, this is what's going to happen. And then what proceeded to happen is what you described at the start of our conversation. Blondell's like, yeah, once you lose action, this is what is going to occur. And there's a funny way in which the oscillation and dialectic of metamodernism is basically like, looking for action <laughs> you know it's like we forgot something and it's like looking for action because you put it very well it, it doesn't have action so it can only oscillate and when you end up where we've ended up without action all you can do is oscillate because there's no action and a lot of people may say you know you could say this you could say that action is what is what has to occur for the dialectic not to ultimately just be in a face is some sort of action. And of course, wherever you act, there will be a new dialectic that is reconstituted in that now. But for nows to transition into different nows, as opposed to dialectics synthesized into different dialectics, that's a kind of critical difference. Um, you know, dialectics don't synthesize into new dialectics, but the now underpinning the dialectic can change. Well, in order for nows to change, there has to be action. Um, and if there's no action, then that's not going to occur. And like you say, you're just going to, well, eventually it will just be an effacement, right? I mean, yeah. basically, if there's not, if there isn't progress, there will be an effacement eventually. It's only a matter of time. Right. Yeah. No, I really like that language of action, action, or uh, I think goal and purpose, as you just said. Is yes. Really good. That, that language critiques both sides. Like it critiques yes. the, the people who want just like pure being and they want these sort of like abstract systems that don't really uh, cohere into anything. Because those people, they, they would say they have a purpose, right? It's like, my purpose is to attain knowledge or to like, you know, develop these philosophical systems. And you could say to, to that person, like, well, okay, but what's your goal? Like, what are you trying to do in the world? Whereas on the other side, you have the pragmatists who are trying to, uh, it's like they have goals, but no purpose, right? right? Like the pragmatist tries to say, well, I know what my goal is. And so I just have to be pragmatic towards my goal. But I would say the whole problem with pragmatism is that it doesn't tell you whether or not your goal is worthy in the first place. Right. right? In order to do that, you have to say, is this goal in line with my ultimate purpose? And what is my ultimate purpose? And where does purpose come from? Right. Right. Um, and so I, I feel like that language, it, it offers a good critique of both sides, but without falling into a trap of, of over certainty or just uh, effacement and deconstruction. Yeah, yeah. and you, you see, one of the reasons why I think Blondell kind of stresses action as opposed to acts is because the danger of acts is acts become doing, doing something, and that becomes consumed by capitalism, like the extrovert society that Susan Ka you know, Cain critiques in Quiet. So there's a concern of action becoming doing something as in I'm escaping boredom, where action has a kind of, kind of almost a reverence to it, kind of like action. There's kind of a higher language to action that seems to be what Blundell wants to you know, stress, yeah. um, a kind of reverence to it. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, I, that, that just caught my my attention the way, like, a, like a director would say action. Yes. And that, that changes the paradigm, right? You're going from a paradigm of, like, in a movie, it's everyone standing around on set being people. And it's like, okay, now, like, in your role, right? Like, engage in the thing that we're doing. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's great. Yeah, because to me, when I ask, you know, if I were to say something to a person, if I were to say, oh, what are you going to do today? You know, oh, I'm going to go to Chick-fil-A and hope, uh, you know, hope the sandwich is good, get some of that Chick-fil-A sauce, and uh, you can tell what I was eating this evening. Uh, you know, but if I were to ask you, what action are you going to carry out today? Oh, uh, what am I going to do today? <laughs> you know, oh gosh. Um, you know, there's something about action that's like, hey, what action are you going to carry out today? It's like you're a king, you're a decree, you're like, oh, what am I going to bring into the world? Oh, frick, what am I going to bring into the world? I'm the director. I'm going to like, what is the action I will bring into the world? Whereas when I say, oh, what are you going to do today? I don't know. Watch some Netflix or something. So what's interesting about action is even like if every single day, it's funny, you know, as I talk to you, it's like if every day you woke up and said to yourself, what action am I going to bring into the world today? You might live a very different life. <laughs> As opposed to what am I going to do today? 
uh, what action am I going to bring into the world today? There's a sort of, there's a, there's something about that, that I, I, that. Well, it's, it's like, it's an act of worship is what it yes, is. Yes, that's right. Looking beyond your current framing to be informed by the source of your being. You know what I mean? Like what, what action am I going to bring into the world as opposed to like, just what goal am I going to accomplish, right? To bring something into the world is like, where are you bringing it from, right? That's right. From whatever, whatever your source of inspiration, like inspire to, to breathe in, right? Whatever fills you, whatever, whatever breathes life into you. Um, it, is, it is an act of aligning yourself with that and seeking union with that ultimately. So I would say that that's an act of worship. Let's see, I had three questions I wanted to ask you before we Please. get into like the, the specifics of like the, the game, the garden, the guide or art centering or any of that. Yes, yes, um, yes. We've, we've addressed two of them. I wanted to ask you about Hegel. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I can only think of two of them now. I feel like we've already done two. The, the last remaining question is uh, a question of theology like I was mm. I was uh, I read your article that you wrote as a sort of a summary of our last conversation which I thought was great by the way and really oh, like yeah. helped me clarify that that whole conversation because you know I mean you know how it is you just sort of like oh yeah, 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 they, yeah. Just say all these things but you were, you were able to sort of bring it all together in a really uh, useful way but one thing that, that caught my attention is you said uh, you brought up how we discussed I propose that we should worship the creator right? And sort of like what that means. And you put in your, in your article, uh, you're like, well, you could interpret this theologically. And I was like, wait a minute, like, how else would you interpret it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what is, what is the creator if not God? And like, what, what, you know, um, and I think there's, there's a relationship, like we we're talking about the artist, right? And the artist, like, like, I'm certainly not proposing that we worship artists, right? Like, and I don't think you, I don't think you are either, but, but like, I just, I just want to, uh, like, I want to get this, this, distinction clear of like what what do i mean by worship the creator right mm. um and so for me like i start maybe this makes me a hegelian but i start from the perspective of my own first person embodied experience of the world as it is right now mm. right and from that perspective i open my eyes and an image is created before me I close my eyes and a different image is created before me. Mm. I am not doing that, right? Mm. And so whatever is doing that, whatever is creating in the present, not as what, it's not 14 billion years ago, right? It's right now, like this world before me is being created. It is being rendered uh, analogous to the way that the image on your screen is being rendered, right? There is a, an influx of substance moving through it, which maintains this form. All reality is a dissipative structure, right? Dissipative structure. Um, like water going down a drain, right? The spiral is held because of the, the movement of water through it. And so too, our reality is like that. And, and I mean, even the scientists would agree with me here um, that our, our, the image, the phenomenological world that we see and hear and smell and touch is being rendered before us in real time. Um, and so when we get into ontological questions of like, what is doing that, right? Um, and, you know, uh, for me, it, it very quickly scales to the most high, right? Because it's sure. like, well, what is doing that? I'm involved in the process because the world that is created before me depends on where I look, right? And I have certain agency within that. Um, but I am not... It, it includes but transcends me and so it's like well the light from the sun is doing that and the light from the sun is upheld by when I, mean, I would say the mind of god a, a materialist might say the the laws of nature but like whatever the the fundamental structure of reality is all of that is participating in the act of creation all the time and so for me it like it, it's not a hard move to go from there is a creator to the creator is the most high god um but sure. all of that, all of those questions are secondary to the fact that there is a creator, which is not me. Like whatever you want to sure. say about the intelligence of the creator or the nature or the will or the possibility of relationship, all of those questions to me are secondary from the, the recognition that I am not the source of the world that I inhabit. Um, and I do have agency within that world, right? Like I can open my eyes, but I can't choose. You can say to me, open your eyes and I'll do it. But you can't say to me, see an elephant in the room, right? I can imagine an elephant, but I can't see it the way that I see my hand in front of me. Um, that has to be given to me by the creator. 
And so whatever that is, and I'm not, I'm not claiming any sort of certainty about what the creator sure. is or what his or her or its will is. Um, I would propose things, but I don't, I don't claim any certainty. But when I say that we should worship the creator, like that's, that's the creator that I'm talking about. Um, and, and so I just like, you know, I don't, I'm, oh, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that. I, I don't mean this as, uh, I'm not trying to come at this argumentatively. I'm just trying no, to no, like no, no, no. clarify uh, my, my position. No, I, I think the phrase worship the creator can indeed be a theological take. Um, it can also be taken um, in the sense of the ability of the human being to say direct causation in directions that are not just like deterministic. Um, you see, I think actually we don't tend to quote unquote praise, you know, the phrase there could be worship the creator, which has the theological um, underpinning. There can also be worship as in praise the creator or the ability of the human beings to not just pro be products of causation. And I think there's an ambiguity there of which I do think the creative act. So, you know, if you have philosophy, philosophical theology and theology, the question becomes, how does one get from, let's say you wanted to engage in theology, the question would become, um, how do you move from philosophy to philosophical theology to theology? In order to do that, you have to operate in philosophy to itself, find within philosophy to itself a way to get to philosophical theology. Then as you get into philosophical theology, you have to find to itself as itself a way to get to theology if you wanted to carry out that kind of move, right? Now, you could just plop yourself into theology if you wanted to do that, and you could just plop yourself into philosophical theology if you wanted to do that. But there's always this question of the possibility of movement between them, and how would that um, go? be carried out. I think the creative act is actually particularly um, fruitful for engaging in those, put, 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 those, possible, those possible moves. And Nicholas Berjaev, um, a Russian theologian, he wrote a book called The Meaning of the Creative Act, and he was a philosophical theologian. And he basically wants to make the claim that the only way you can explain the possibility of human creativity um, is through some sort of theological source, which even if you don't believe it's intelligible or whatever, it's going to be a transcendent source and so on and so forth. And that would get you into the questions of that nature. I think you put it, I think you put it very well when you said that I can't say see an elephant and thus see an elephant. So there's some sort of givenness to being, right? And I think the phrase kind of worship the creator where you're kind of worshiping the givenness of being um, is a very important um, way to carry yourself in the world. Uh, because if not, then the world is no longer, say, a gift. The world is no longer something that is presented to you to enjoy. Maybe it's just a prison cell, right? Maybe it's just something you're trapped in. So worshiping the creator or the force that made things given to you, I think, is the correct disposition. But to me, when I say it can be interpreted theologically, that's to suggest that there's an ambiguity there where it could have a finite meaning that simultaneously possibly participates in an infinite meaning, but not necessarily. Like what you are saying, I think, has philosophical weight, even if someone were to read it and not believe you could transition from that to theology. You see what I'm saying? Um, I think it has I think it has value regardless in any other way. Ambiguity to me, I mean, in kind of the William Epson sense, which is like multiple possibilities simultaneous. Now, the thing about ambiguity is that one then afterwards has to do the work of Okay, I see where the phrase could potentially, it definitely has finite value. Could it also have infinite possibilities? And if so, is that infinity conscious? Is it Krishna? Is it Allah? Is it Jesus? You know, whatever and so forth. Well, that, every, that would all require a book, right? That would all require its, its own work. So I certainly don't think, uh, for me, worship the creator can absolutely work in any of those spaces that you wanted yeah. it to. You just have to fit it. How would it work in a in a non theological context? Because to me, like to worship the Creator without ascribing a transcendent nature to the Creator is that's the epitome of of idolatry. It can to be identify to to identify as the Creator to say I am the Creator is that is the ultimate idolatry. That's the you know that's that's the fall. Like that's that's uh, so well, that's like, fair. I, like a human, a human, and I see this all over. You know, what I mean, sure. like I see artists artists today think of themselves as creators you know i mean they, they think of themselves as the source of their power in the world and it causes tremendous problems i would say so like oh I yeah would, absolutely I would, like i guess I'm, I'm trying to differentiate here and say like the artist is not a, a creator per se like or the word art means to fit together right 
Um, the, the root comes from words like arsenal, uh, articulate, arrange, right? So it's about bringing together. As you, I mean, as you well know, art century, right? Brings disparate things together. Um, but that's different than, than creation. You know what I mean, and like, even if I take disparate things, like even if I take different pieces of wood and make a table, that that is still dependent on the conditionality that we live in a world that has gravity and that has these particular structures, and that we live in a world where where if you put a flat thing on two legs or four legs, uh, it makes a table, right? And that's like, right. we we take this totally for granted, but that's like that's an act of magic that that like we have these parts and then we bring them together somehow and just poof, it's a table now, you know what I mean? Like that, that doesn't make it, that's not, I can't take responsibility for that. Like once I recognize that pattern, once I am able to grasp that pattern in reality, then I can, I can sort of fulfill it, right? I can act as a, as a director, as you say, like, I don't, I don't create the world, but I do have agency within it. Um, but I would just like, to me, it's very important to make that distinction between creation and, and uh, action as it were. No, that's very fair. If, if I were taking what I sent you and putting it in the paper format, because I put it in the file for Belonging Again Part 2, because I would like to put it together, because I want all of the meta-modern action to be about it, I would make distinctions between, say, lowercase, you know, last time I was telling you about the problem when I talk about return, I always want to put it in parentheses, or the kind of thing you were saying with repetition and negation using the same term, I was talking about parentheses, like, I would make distinctions between, like, a lowercase c creator, capital C creator, I would say, like, you see, with lowercase, the problem precisely becomes the notion of the artist who thinks of themselves as a complete system in that creation, where everything, they're not determined in any way whatsoever. Where the best that humans can do, humans, um, to use language from uh, a paper called Experiencing Thinking, uh, where it makes distinctions between causation and creation, human beings can, as at best, be a mixture of creator slash causer. Um, you know, and that they can be a mixture of creative and causal forces, but they cannot be just creative. Say that would require a transcendent essence, right? That's what would require you to be God. So no, I would definitely, if I were expanding what I sent you into a full of paper, make those distinctions, because absolutely, it, it, you can get in the same way that autonomous rationality, like I talk about all the time, leads to totalitarianism, you know, all of that destruction, autonomous creativity, the notion of I can create anything or I'm just always creative, creates very neurotic, pathological and crazy artist people. And also, and that create a lot of problems. So there is absolutely like the only way you can talk about autonomous anything and then not be neurotic is basically if you're talking about God you know, simply because you would replace autonomous with simplicity, right? As like theologians meant, right? You would say God is simply creative as in he is not composed of composite parts or, or so on and so forth. So no, what you're saying, I completely agree with what you're saying. Those distinctions would certainly need to be made um, in a more elaborate piece. Right on. Yeah. And I, I thought you would, I just wanted to, uh, to kind of clarify that terminology. Sure. I feel like, I feel like at this point in the conversation, it's just important that we get our terms straight so that we can. Oh, it's the hardest thing in the world. I mean, it, it's, it's the hardest thing in the world and it is extremely important. Like I told you, you know, um, a lot of times conversation, you know, I, I like, I, I like, I do, I tend to like to write a lot of things precisely because in writing, you can make certain capitalization slashes parentheses that is very difficult to do in speech that kind of, especially when you're talking about this kind of philosophy, this meta quote unquote modern dialectical philosophy, speech is very difficult as a medium. And I'm not saying we shouldn't talk, but uh, you know, but the speech is part of the problem in some respects. Um, and I'm not saying that writing necessarily overcomes it, but in let's put it this way, in speech, the clarification of the terms is like ultra important because in writing, I can just visually show you the difference with a capital letter. I can like, or I can write it out, right? Where in speech, you only have the audio, you know, the um, audio, the voice. Uh, and so then you really do have to hold to a particular term. Uh, so if I were saying what I wrote there, um, it would be like that human beings are, they would be artists, they would not be creators. I would, I would say something like that, or they would be causers slash creators, but they would be like, they, they are artists, but they cannot ex nihilo. You know, Berjaya basically makes the point in the Fondane paper, we'll talk about this, that only, you know, the reason God is God is because he's the only one who can create because true creation must be ex nihilo. It must have a certain out of nothing principle to it. Uh, and that's something like Berjaya will say or something. Yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, that's the distinction I would use would be God is the creator, we can be artists. You know, sure. We can, 
we can bring the disparate uh, aspects of God's creation together into something that is good or beautiful or whatever. But I guess uh, like that goodness does depend on on the the transcendent or I guess just transcendental will of the creator. And it depends on us being able to, to come into contact with that somehow and, and have some sort of uh, confidence in, in what that is, right? Mm-hmm. Because if it's good, if it's just good for me, it's like, well, okay, so what, right? Wow. Um, but yeah, anyways, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm good at that. Oh, no. Well, I mean, to me, it gets interesting because I'll actually talk about like in reconstructing A's at the beginning. I call it this will sound really weird, a term called alterology. And the phrase is like alterology because you have a lot of people talking about the singularity. They're talking about psychedelic experiences or they're talking about religious experience or spiritual. So there are these alternative ways of being that seem to be what a lot of people are talking about. And what I kind of talk about is it becomes difficult in a lot of online conversations because people will be talking from different positions of alterology about philosophy, where you first have to go from philosophy or at least make sure everyone's on the same page. If like you enter into a discussion, you're going to say, hey, we're going to be talking from the assumption of the singularity. Hey, we're going to be talking from the assumption that God exists. Hey, you know, from the possible, we're going to talk from the assumption of the possibility of pure being in an altered state of consciousness, even if pure being is not possible um, in a normal state of consciousness, so on and so forth. To me, that's where you get philosophy, philosophical alterology and alterology. Um, And the question becomes, how do you move into those things? Um, And what is the process? And that's ultimately too action, uh, you know, action through those. Um, and also why you end up having to write 10,000 books, uh, because you have to like go from the alterology to the philosophical alterology to alterology, because there's actually a very good question that you're pointing at to is philosophy ultimately going to have any weight or authority or power or significance if it ultimately does not connect with some sort of alterology. And then the theologians are going to come along and be like, yeah, basically the only alterology that has a chance is theology. And then the, you know, the singularity people will come along and be like, God doesn't exist. So the only chance is this, you know, the freaking singularity as an altered state of being. And then the psychedelic people are going to come along and be like, no, nah, the technological singularity is going to be the freaking apocalypse. The only chance is an altered state of consciousness that comes from psychedelic drugs. And all of the alterologists then have debates among themselves and we have to go from there. But it would seem to the point that you're getting at that some sort of alterology ultimately has a role to play in the conversation. What does that look like? How do you go from there, et cetera, so forth. That, that to me is a very big, big, big question. Yeah, I like, I like that. I never heard that term, alterology. But yeah, I like may, I've made it up. So, you know, oh, you're, the, okay. you're <laughs> actually the first person to hear it. So. Hey, right on, I feel honored. Um, yeah, and that, that kind of brings back our language of goal and purpose, right? Yes. Is that like, if you if you just do alterology, then you might have two uh, alterologists who are working on the same goal, but towards different purposes. Yes. Right? Um, and so it's like, well, we agree that we can do this goal, right? And it's like, okay, but then you do that, and it's like, wait, I thought we were doing it for this reason. Right. Oh, I thought we were doing it for this reason, and then it then it, it has crazy conflict. And I think what you're saying about the the singularity as uh, it's like if you have if you're going for the singularity without a clear understanding of what your God is, then like, it's going to be the ultimate totalizing tyranny. Yes. Like if if your singularity is not serving some transcendent, transcendental purpose, um, it's not transcendent because you have to, you have to know about it somehow. Um, but some transcendental purpose, which is, which is above and beyond your immediate goal, then it's, it will be subverted by whoever is willing to, uh, assert his goal the hardest. You know what I mean? It's just going to be whoever's the, whoever can convince other people that, that my goal is the right goal to have as our purpose, that person's going to be in charge and it's going to become tyranny. Um, oh, it's, again, uh... this, is, this is why I keep like, before we get into any of this stuff about like, you know, the garden or any of that stuff, it's like, I do think we need to be clear about like, what, what do we worship? You know what I mean? Like talking oh, sure. about modernism, postmodernism, whatever, like, in the modern world, it was appropriate to ask somebody, um, what religion do you belong to, right? In the postmodern world, that's no longer an appropriate question because pe- most people don't belong to a religion. So to me, in our postmodern, hypermodern, whatever, the world that we live in, the appropriate question is, what do you worship? 
right? Mm-hmm. And that's a different question because like, um, you can say, if somebody asks you what religion do you belong to, it feels sort of empowering to say like, well, I don't belong to any religion. Right. So I'm, I'm independent. But if I say, what do you worship? And you say, oh, I don't worship anything. It's like, that, that has a different feeling, right? It's like, you don't worship anything. You don't serve anything. Like you don't, you don't bow down to anything. Like just you, your like your own That's little good. narcissistic ego is the highest thing in your mm-hmm. ontology and your, uh, your epistemology and your, in your value system of values um that's that's not good right and so like if we're gonna pull off anything if we're gonna do an act if we're gonna do an act we need to to have a sense of what our action is serving ultimately right and like ultimately not just to a point but like what is the point what is the ultimate point um and but we got to do that without without becoming tired without uh that that ultimate point has to be uh it can't, it can't be the old school platonic one that never changes and is just fixed. And, you know, I mean, it has to, it has to facilitate this dialectical process. It has to be at once um, non-contingent, but also contingent. Like there's this, you get into all these paradoxes of like, you have to have a, a God, which is, which is perfect and transcendent, but also uh, can overcome itself and be imminent and changed, you know what I mean? So it's like, it does, it does create real philosophical or uh, real theological issues. But I think, I think if we can just start with the name of like, whatever, because we all, we all live in a world in which we can communicate, right? So like, even though I have my own phenomenological view on the world and you have your own phenomenological view on the world, the fact that we can talk to each other between our two worlds means that the creator is common to us, right? Right. Has to, Um, like whatever is creating my world is also creating your world or else we couldn't talk to each other. I think like I would, I would hold that position. Sure. Um, And so I think if we could just start there of like, we're going to, to act so as to serve the will of whatever it is, which is creating us. um, I think we can engage a dialectical uh, process because immediately the question is going to be like well what is that will right but then we can say well you know i think god's will is mercy and somebody else can say well i think god's will is justice and then we can have a dialectical process and we can have this whole negation con- uh, abstraction negation concretization Increasing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and we can we can engage in that process but i do think we need we need the ultimate i would say what do you think well, a um, few things. One, when you said the point, it really brought to mind the rock climber, kind of suggesting how that all get there has to be a point to climbs. I really thought those all went together very well. Um, for for Blondell, action leads into theology. Uh, you know, that was one of the reasons he, you know, when he was like defending his dissertation, he he ended up in hot water because he basically was like, if you take action seriously, there must be a theological principle. Now, for him, that leads into Christianity and different things, uh, but he didn't necessarily say it had to be that way. He was just kind of saying there, there basically has to be a point, to use your language. If, if, every, if, if we are all rock climbing, then there must be eventually a point toward which we are climbing, because there's no such thing as a mountain that doesn't have a point is basically what he kind of concludes. It just, uh, you know, I'll, let me just interject here though, and say that, like, again, goal and purpose. Like as a climber, there's the, there's the climb that I'm working on right now, but then there's like the ultimate, my, my progression as a rock climber. Right. right. And that is, that is ultimately, uh, it transcends my, my framing. Like I will never reach, I know that I will never reach that goal right I, like i have sure. or that 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 purpose i will never fulfill that purpose right i will never beat the game of rock climbing um and so like it this, this to me addresses the the question of like intrinsic motivation right. like how do you have a how do you have a goal that you're actually committed to in the face of existential lack right it's like i know as a rock climber that when i if i'm working on a climb there's tension right there's there's a state that I want to be in, which is the state of having completed the climb. And there's a state that I'm currently in, which is the state of not having completed the climb. And I know full and well that if I reach that state of having completed the climb, it's going to feel really good for about 10 minutes. And then I'm going to start looking for something else to climb, right? And that existential lack is going to return. 
But as a rock climber, like I'm totally cool with that, right? Like I, I wouldn't want it to be any other way because then it's like I would just be done. <laughs> like there's no fun in that. I'd climb a climb and be like, well, I'm done. I've, you know, I've fulfilled that. Um, and so I think that the point has to be transcendent in that way. Like it has to be, um, the point has to be, I don't want to say it has to be a process, but it's something like that. You know what I mean? Like as a climber, it's the stoke. That's the word that we use. It's like we, the point of climbing is to, is to remain stoked. You know what I mean? And so that like in order to remain stoked, you need the, the, the short term goal, but, but the stoke is the purpose, I would say, you know? Different well, climbers might have a different take on no, it. No, I think I think that's perfect with um, because it would seem, if I understand Blondell correctly, there's a notion where he wants to say basically the following. He's like, if your action, if you knew that your action was ultimately going to arrive at a kind of failure, you know, where you don't actually reach a final point where you're the ultimate claimer, you say die at you know seventy two, then he's like, you would never carry out the action. In order for the action to eventually finally manifest in a final moment of your final climb, there has to be a transcendent element. If there was not a transcendent element, you would not do it. He says, therefore, action must be connected with the transcendent, is basically what he wants to say. And for him, that equals Christianity. Now, I think some of the people that were arguing with him were like, I don't know if you can get to Christianity from that, except you could, you, maybe you can only get to a, a transcendent, right? And I think, the, and then he proceeds to try to, do that now that's a different question though which one would have to carry out at a different time um yeah i, I wouldn't make that move but i would i would take it to the transcendent i would say that like action without without transcendence is just it's just narcissism really. well and so what ends up happening is he's like action requires a transcendence that cannot be empirically reserved or reduced to the physical you know therefore there is that therefore action is inherently philosophical. You know, he's 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 he has a sense that action has an irreducible element to it that is the grounds for like it is philosophy. Like it is what philosophy is all about, is this very strange way in which we require a transcendent to operate in the finite. And that this is what philosophy should be about. And he's like, when philosophy isn't about that, um. It's, it's done. He's like, it's going to be deconstructed. He basically predicted Derrida. He's like, this is going to be de deconstructed. You cannot continue a philosophy that is not basically entirely orbiting the very strange reality that humans need a transcendent to operate, to even engage in action. And he's like, oh, and by the way, we know that man is engaged in action. He's like, that is not speculative. We know that humans are engaged in action right now. So he's like, action is always already occurring. And the only way action would always already be occurring is if there was a notion of transcendence. Now, he wants to argue at the beginning of his book, he's like, now the problem is with modern, he, you know, he doesn't use the language of modernism. That's not really the language. He's like, he's like, one of the problems of the world today is people's transcendence is nothingness. He's like, not, like, nothingness is becoming a kind of transcendence that action is operating in toward. He's like, and guess what? That's going to lead to, he, he, he like, he's like, that's going to lead to boredom. That's going to lead to deconstruction. That's going to kill us all, is what he's saying. He's like, people's transcendence today is nothingness. And he, so he starts off the book being like, you can't do that. That's not going to work. <laughs> he's like, this is going to be bad. He's like, you have to have transcendence, have some sort of positive element. But you say, he says, but that's so weird because that means the positive transcendence must ultimately be something that we in some strange way relate to as a failure. Like, because we never full, we never fulfill it. Um, I think you could overlay, um, it would be another subject. I think you can overlay what Blondell is getting at with Paul Tillich's ultimate concern and courage to be, that's another thinker. I think Paul Tillich is very good on that subject. Um, and so Blondell seems to be saying something along the lines of, if action exists, then there must be ultimate concern. And if there is ultimate concern, then there is the possibility of courage to be. And the subjects of philosophy should be what is ultimate concern? What should be our ultimate concern? And how do we have the courage to be, to participate in and live out that ultimate concern? That seems to be what Blondell is getting at. Um, also on the, uh, the idea of alterology. Yeah, you know, if I don't die, the last book will basically, you know, the last book is, is there such a thing? A book I want to do is called Alterologies, where he goes through the global singularity, 
psychedelics, theology, because I think a big problem that's happening today is a lot of people are engaging in conversation are engaging in conversations from different positions of alterology. And as a result, there's a lot of misunderstanding and talking through one another, or, or actually they will shift into philosophy and then shift into alterology and then shift back into philosophy kind of randomly. And as a result, the discussion can get bogged down. Now that's something interesting enough that a lot of people in Europe said, that's why we need to keep philosophy and theology apart, not because philosophy and theology not because theology is bad necessarily, but when you kind of blur them, you end up doing both poorly is what ends up happening. Like if you want to do philosophy well, you keep it separate from theology. And if you want to do theology well, you keep it separate from theology. I mean, from philosophy. And then within the internal consistency of each, see if you can transition to the next. So it was separation, almost like separation in church of state in America for the benefit of both. Likewise, I think we need to start thinking in terms of separation of alterology and philosophy for the sake of both. Because there's a lot of people bringing in notions of being based on an assumption of technological progress or from a psychedelic experience of which which changes the nature of the discussion. So there's a kind of bringing in of alterology that is problematic. That is not because I am not saying there is no legitimacy to any of this, but in order to kind of maintain the language or to maintain the discussion, those distinctions are. So I'd like to do a final book called Alterology. Uh, if you true isn't the rational belonging again, oh my gosh, I'm gonna die. Uh, but you know, I think alterology is a really important concept in all this. I definitely agree. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, to me, the alterologist who doesn't do philosophy is the quote unquote progressive, right? It's like, what oh, sure. do you progress towards exactly? And they never have a clear answer to that. It's like, well, you know, like, the good future that we all want it's like well yeah hold on a second um and so yeah i definitely think that's good and i, I wanted to comment on uh the the non-positive god right the idea mm. that we can have we can worship like nothingness um and uh, you know there's a there, again we get into like this weird yeah uh, yeah yeah, yeah, language yeah game where writing would be easier because right? there's nothingness and then there's like sure. no thingness right because like i'm not saying god is a thing i'm not saying that god is a being within the world but uh but i would ascribe a positive reality i wouldn't i wouldn't merely um i guess i would merely describe god in the negative but i would ascribe a positive reality you know what i mean because yeah. it's transcendent we can't describe the transcendent but we can we can uh ascribe some being some pillar some some principle well yeah um, and not to interrupt i mean you could even get into apostatic alterology i mean basically you would negative theology negative positive theology you know because that's a problem people will throw out nothing well as what you know it's like what what does that mean and it can and it begins to not to interrupt but you're right on what yeah, you're no, saying well, I, I just think you're right that you either end up in boredom or nihilism or you end up in uh like a, a negative state of being where it's it's like we don't know what god is but but we know what he isn't and so we can we can like attack that like again you know the the sort of uh the mob mentality that we see so much of today that's very much on like well, we don't have a positive good but we know what bad is and so you get scapegoat that's the word scapegoating so you get boredom you get nihilism you get scapegoating um or you get narcissism, right? Because you just feel, you just project your own will onto the positive. It, you you project your own will into the lack of the positive. Um, you say, well, well, my, you don't do this consciously, but people do this all the time. They say, well, I worship the God that is nothing. And so therefore my will is the will of God. You know what I mean? Well, and, and, uh, not, and not to interrupt. Although I've done it twice now. One, of the, great, <laughs> one of the great problems is that everyone today is kind of like a negative ideology. Conservatives, liberals, everyone. It's like negative ide. It's not because people like, you know, people will be like ideology is bad. Right. Well, Zizek, I, I agree with Zizek. Everyone is always already an ideology. The problem, you know, and you could say worldview, whatever, that's a different conversation. But the problem is precisely what you're saying. Like what you see today is a whole lot of negative ideology. Like a whole lot of, you know, this is not what America is supposed to be, right? You know, we need to get back to America or, oh, this isn't diverse enough. Well, what is diverse? You know, what do these things even mean? It's like, it's a lot of negative ideology in the sense of negative theology that I think is very problematic. Yeah, it's the, I mean, it's the anti-body. I mean, it's the anti-identity of like, yeah. we are, who are we? Well, we are anti-fascist. We are anti-racist. It's like, okay, but what are you pro? 
You know what I mean? Like, as far as I can tell, the anti-fascists aren't pro anything. They have no positive identity whatsoever. And, and what the anti-anti-fascists, which are just yeah. more anti-anti-anti. It's all just anti. There's no, there's no, there's no phallus. Like, there's no. Yeah, and what ends up problem. happening is when we're not careful. Like, what ends up happening when people bring in alterology and mix it with philosophy, they actually will end up kind of engaging in a negative philosophy that becomes kind of destructive because the ground from it is outside the philosophy. So to itself, it becomes negative without them even realizing it. So one of the reasons it can be very important to maintain these distinctions is so you don't unintentionally end up in something that's practically negative without even realizing it. So for example, let's say you believe in Jesus or something, like let's say you're a Christian and that's your alterology. Well, you, if you are, say, designing a community, like a metamodern community, are, are you designing it in a manner that it will only work if everyone ascribes to your same alterology? Because if so, the design of it requires the acceptance of that alterology. And if you don't, if you don't realize that your philosophy actually entails an alterology without realizing it, you may unintentionally design a community that's foundation is not found in the community itself or the philosophy or the, um, the ideas of the community, but comes from an outside source. And as a result, the community itself is negative, um, unless, except for the people who share in the alterology. But because that is not explicit or known, you unintentionally get a deconstruction or the organization will break down. And I think that's one of actually the great challenges of the question of metamodern, how does one act to make metamodernism become metamodernity? You know, that big question is how do you make sure it is going to operate on all these different levels, you know, mind, body, spirit, et cetera, without unintentionally having some sort of underlying alterology that therefore just means well, that just means it's basically a church, right? Maybe it's the church of the singularity. Maybe it's the church of the psychedelic. Maybe it's the church of whatever. Wokeness, Trump, we can fill in whatever. Um, and I actually think that's what happens all the time. I think that is extremely common where people are trying to create new communities where the foundation for those communities are actually from an alterology without them realizing it. And as a result, it doesn't function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, I mean, this is like the great, to me, this is such a deep problem. And yes. Like this, this sums up everything we've been talking about in this conversation, I think, which is that um, it's like, okay, we have all these people who are fragmented and disparate and uh, living their own individual idiosyncratic lives. And we want to create some sort of community, right? right. I, think, I think most people in this space want that. Um, it's like, okay, so do we, if there's the philosophy and then there's the alterology, um, like, which do we start with, right? Do we right. become united in our philosophy? Well, but in order to do that, as you've been saying, we need action, right? Which calls right. for the alterology. And so it's like, okay, so then we unite in our alterology. But wait a minute, how are you going to do alterology together if you don't have a common philosophy, right? So That's it's right. Like, ah, what do we do? <laughs> and so, uh, so I guess my answer would be to smash them together with the garden and say garden is at once an alterology and a philosophy right? It is, and a theology, you know, you can take it to all these levels. Um, and, but, but that's, you know, that's maybe another, another discussion, but is that like, is that fair of like, that, is that a conflict of mind to you that, that, um, you need, you need alterology to do philosophy, but you need philosophy to do alterology. And so if you have people who aren't doing either one of those, if you have people who are just deconstructing everything or else just sort of like living in this oscillation, like then what? Like where where do you bring unity into the picture? So that's a great question. Um, <laughs> you know, that is like a zillion dollar question. Um, all right. So it would seem as if on the question of metamodern action, which would be the question of how does one make metamodernism begin to contribute to metamodernity, which would be a seemingly Hegelian esque philosophical move, it require a Hegelian-esque dialectic oscillation way of being of which would best be described as a kind of action in the Blondel sense. What then is the communal structure in which action can be carried out 
of which makes possible uh, living together, community, so on and so forth, that functions metamodernly, because if it has a single alterology, it's modern, right? Mm -hmm. It's not actually metamodern if it has a single alterology. If it has no alterology, it's postmodern. There's no alterology. So a metamodern structure, if we want to use that language, or metamodernity, let's just say metamodernity for the structure of metamodernism and the socioeconomic and so on and so forth. Metamodern, metamodernity would seem to require multiple alterologies. Unless we just want to say that metamodernity is not possible, then you have to have a modernism or postmodern that, you know, you could say that this is not possible. We are now entering into the speculative reason to say what exactly would a truly metamodern solution look like, as opposed to a solution that is actually modern or actually postmodern. And, you know, that's one of Denver's critiques, right? He'll say that the liminal web is proposing not metamodern, you know, they're not proposing metamodernity, they're proposing things that are either more modern or post, post, um, postmodern. So for me, if we were to start that question, it must entail multiple al alterologies. Okay, so, do you, so we're asking like a truly metamodern solution. Do you understand what I'm saying? To me, it would have to entail multiple alterologies. It would have to entail a focus on action. It would have to think in terms of philosophical gear, not philosophical thought. And the structure, therefore, the first question I would ask is this. Does it seem, therefore, that the structure is something very open, like a field with a fence, which is arguably not even a structure, but it is a kind of structure because it's different from, say, a field that doesn't have a fence. It doesn't seem like it can be a skyscraper. And obviously, I'm talking metaphorically. A skyscraper seems very modern in design, right? You know, modernism is city, which is funny because a city entails diversity, right? But you see... Modernism dealt with diversity by creating a single alterology in the form of, uh, you know, the perfect uh, analytical proof. That was a kind of onto, that was a kind of alterological pursuit, it, which which Girdle destroyed. So it seems like it would have to make space for multiple alterologies. But if that is the case, we know that people who are different really struggle to get along. So. This is where it seems like philosophy and dialectic and conditioning is really, really important. For me to handle being along other people who have different alterologies and not lose my mind, that would seem like it requires a certain level of training, right? Like, because it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I really like the word conditioning because conditioning is both conditions. You have to meet the conditions of X, but conditioning also means exercise. You know, you have to train, you have to condition, right? There's something here where philosophy is the conditioning. The, so philosophy is necessary as a conditioning to make it possible to handle the presence of multiple alterologies, which would also entail a certain dialectical relationship um, so that you're not existentially overwhelmed and being able to sustain that, to uphold that, requires a certain conditioning of which you will not be able to do if you don't know what philosophical gear to bring when and how and to what degree. So something about metamodernity seems like a society of people, you know, if we're starting on the social, because next you'd have to get into the economics, right? You got a social economics. So the first question is, what is the nature of the social, the culture dynamic? dimension. And for me, those are the first things that come to mind. I'd be curious how you respond to that. No, I, I think that's right on. Um, I think that, I think in order to make it work, there has to be, uh, like you say, there has to be multiple alterologies, but those alterologies have to be coordinated by a shared purpose, right? right. Coordinated, like, like, you know, I would, I would, reach for the deepest etymology of that word right to be mm. coordinated it means that like there is an order from which you and i are both coordinated oh coordinated i just heard it that way that's nice right, right. coordinated like like we are ordered by the same ordering principle Ooh. um and it, it, so okay so in order to do that you need 
like uh, to put it to put it more con concretely, you need a, a dialectic between Noah's Ark and Elijah's altar. Right? Mm. So like these are these are both these are two ways to deal with an end of the world situation, right? Uh, Noah and Elijah are both stories where the prophet comes into the world at like at a time where the world is falling apart, right? And so what what Noah does is he gathers the faithful into the no into the ark, um, and so you could say like he he coordinates all you know he he gathers all these things so they cooperate that's the word cooperate mm. the animals and the people and Noah as the captain um, and God ordering the whole thing around they are all cooperating right. Um, whereas Elijah, what Elijah does is he, he comes into the world at a time when Israel has fallen into idol worship and depravity and they've all but forgotten the God of Israel, right? right? And so what he does is unlike the other prophets, he doesn't come into the town square and say, hey, stop worshiping idols. He comes into the town square and says, go ahead, worship your idol, right? Let's have a competition. He right. says, you build your altar. I'll build my altar. You prepare your sacrifice. I'll prepare my sacrifice. You call on the name of your God. I'll call on the name of my God. And whichever God answers by delivering fire from heaven wins, right? And so in this, they are they are coordinated by the task, by the, like he is gathering everyone together in the town square and focusing their attention on the same place. And he is, he is reasserting that the ultimate purpose is to serve the one true God, right? And, but he, he's saying like, well, it could be your, like, I don't know. You say your God is the one true God. I say my God is the one true God. Let's find out, right? Whoever's God answers with a, it's like, it's this relationship where we try something and then we see what happens and then we reflect on it, right? Um, and so there is a, like, that is the beginning of, of uh, coordination because he's bringing these fragmented people together, but he's doing it through competition, right? They're, they're coordinated, but they're not cooperating. They're, they're fighting with each other, right? Um, and so for me, the garden presents a dialectic between this, right? On the one hand, we're trying to gather many disparate identities into the garden so they can cooperate with each other and, and work together. On the other hand, there will be many, like the garden is made of many gardens, each made of many gardens, and they're all gonna have their own philosophy, their own alterology, and they're gonna be fighting it out to see whose is the best, right? And so my thing is like, well, you build your garden, I'll build mine, and let the trees be judged by their fruits, right? Um, but it, it, like I say, it's not it's not all the way Elijah's because obviously, like you know, he after after uh, the prophets of Baal get no response, and and after his altar is lit on fire, he gathers up all the prophets of Baal and puts them to death, right? And so like I'm not suggesting we we do that, but uh, but it will be like I do think the garden presents a a test you know i mean it's like prove yourself you think you have this philosophy that you think can be enacted into a good alterology or you have an alterology that you think is aligned with a good philosophy like let's see you know what i mean and this way we can try it with a garden instead of a country so that if things go wrong it's like well it's not i mean there's still real consequences but it's not it's not the end of the world um and so that's but again not not getting too far into the details i would hold that dialectic in order to bring a fragmented world Together, you need a dialectic between cooperation and competition. You need to be coordinated within a dialectic between cooperation and uh, competition. Is that how you feel about that? Uh, no, I, I think that basically is something of that nature has to occur. Um, one of the ideas, whether it was perfect, good, or terrible or not, of a federalist system, now maybe this is idolizing what was intended by that in the federalist papers, is that you have states that do different ways of doing things, you have competition, see which one is better, and wherever you want to live, you go and live, and where you don't want to live, you don't want to live. And gradually, especially through modernism, the, the United States became, you know, the mistake, the United States are became the United States is, and there was a movement toward greater and greater totalization, which some people say is great, other people say is bad. It is indeed the case with totalization, you get greater and greater conflict because people tend to feel like when their guy's not president that they're completely oppressed and there's no way they can go where it just kind of flips back and forth and every four years may feel like the end of the world to one group of people or whatever. So that can be a risk of that. Um, but if you have different states, some can be immoral and do terrible things to minorities, right? So you have power to try to stop that. It's always trade-offs. Um, but generally speaking, the notion we have to, there would have to be some level of a kind of 
different people try and attempt different things relative to the setups that they think work. Um, and then we see what happens, right? Uh, one of the reasons I like the model that you present with the garden is because it makes space for a way to economically support um, economically support experimentation as such. Um, that seems to be the first really important step is that it would seem as if it would almost need to be the, what is the economic model that would make space for this kind of experimentation? that we're describing. Now, as you know, I, I really like Anthony at in, in, um, Intrinsic Research Co., the notion of using Web 3.0 to make possible investments in intrinsic value or notions of value, to make, which would make space for said experimentation so that you could figure out uh, which, which of these meta-modernisms, uh, these meta-modern actions have a chance or the best shot of materializing into meta-modernity. And then, of course, maybe ultimately the only possibility of meta-modernity is a, a kind of more federalist structure of lots of smaller groups doing different things relative to how they found in their uniqueness uh, to live with multiple alterologies. And then people would say, well, that just sounds like countries, right? That just sounds like, uh, you know, different nations. And maybe what the problem is, is that nations, in fact, today are all just expressions of global capitalism and they don't have the space to engage in these experimentations because basically they all have to practically end up working the same nine to five, which then means people basically live a very similar way. They have very similar needs and there's a natural sort of ironing out of difference that occurs when people have to have very similar schedules uh, that they have to engage in similar ways and similar times of day. Um, so the economic question seems kind of paramount to make space for those experimentations. And then if you could solve that, the question would become is like, okay, well, I would like to create a metamodern community that's focused on the arts. I'd like to do a metamodern community that's focused on people who are bound by the shared purpose of rock climbing or same purpose of art or same purpose of microfinancing, so on and so forth. Um, that's where you it would seem like you could start moving. And at that point, maybe the difference between a nation and these kind of meta-modern communities that we're describing is a nation seems to be bound by the shared purpose of the common history, the common landscape, the common tradition. We're, we're, what we're describing is a shared action, um, a shared purpose, where you start making nations relative to shared action. Not race, not ethnicity, not money. It's almost, that's kind of funny, huh? You know, it's almost like we've had a lot of attempts of organizing nations or people in terms of work, in terms of um, culture, in terms of race problematically and other things, but we really haven't had much of an attempt at, you know, a shared, like organizing people by shared action in an official governmental sense. You know, we've had official governmental organizations, political organizations, Unions are an example. You could say of a political body that's an expression of work. You could have, um, you know, obviously um, different different special interest groups. Uh, you could say, but really, like, but and you've had countries that have labeled themselves, unfortunately, in terms of ethno nationalism and things like that. But really, like a political body, a socio political body that defines itself primarily in terms of shared action. That doesn't seem as well tried, but I'm thinking on the spot here. And maybe that is kind of a little bit of the uniqueness of what meta-modernity would look like. Yeah, I think I think that's really good. I would refer to Alexander Bard's work here with the, he talks about the tribe, the clan, yeah. the nation, and the empire, and the different, uh, uh, the di just the different need, just the differences between those. Um, and like, I would say nation, to me, nation is united in language. Like to me, a nation, like yeah. the Hebrew nation is the people who speak Hebrew, right? The French are the people who speak French. Um, and that to me is the fundamental uniting principle is like, Hey, we can talk to each other. And so we're the same in that way. Um, whereas tribe is like, we live together and we actually know each other and like, you know, share the same physical living situation. Hmm. Um, and so I would like, I see meta modernity as a return to to tribalism in some way, but but with a a uh, with a preservation of um, what would you call that multiculturalism, right? With a preservation sure. of like we can't just go back to tribalism and then fight it all out. We have to have different tribes that are coordinated somehow. Um, and so, like to me, I go, I try and bring it up to the highest and down to the lowest, right? So, like to me, the highest um, purpose is to serve the will of 
the almighty creator philosophy purpose whatever is the the abstract that we're united in um i try and take that up to the highest and say that that should be the service of the almighty god and then i try and take the alterology down to the lowest and say that like our, our shared alterology should be to change uh the factory farm into the food forest right because mm. i think that that's an alterology that like most people can get behind that you know and uh it does like it does if you just have the alterology then it's like well you're creating a food forest in order to bring in your uh your utopia of diversity and you're creating a food forest in order to create your utopia where everyone's the same the singularity um and so those are going to work across purposes if we don't have the philosophy right but if we have the philosophy without the act the uh, alterology as we've been saying then you're just going to get a face right. um and so like i would propose those two things at the same time that the philosophy should be how do we serve God, but without without trying to attach that to any specific revelation from the past, right? I think that in order to figure out how to serve God, we have to we have to constantly engage in this dialectical process that we've been describing. Um, and then I would also try and unite people in the alterology and say, hey, like whatever your philosophy is, like can't we agree that food forests are better than factory farm? Like wouldn't that be good sure. if our food came from a food forest as opposed to a factory farm not to not to entirely diminish the factory farm like obviously that you know i'd say that played a, an important role in history of feeding you know there's lots of people oh, sure. who were, were sure. taken out of poverty by the creation of the factory farm and we shouldn't right. uh, we shouldn't forget that but yeah. now moving forward you know from starting from the context that we're in i would say that that move is necessary um and so i would i would propose those two things at the same time does that make sense Oh yeah. Well, there does seem to be, if if we were to look at pragmatism from a, um, you know, looking at that separate from action, one of the advantages of pragmatism when you start saying, well, isn't a food forest better than a factory farm from a kind of just use standpoint from a sort of practice? There's a way in which pragmatism can function kind of alterologically where it's like, well, just look at it, you know, or if you say, wouldn't it be practically better if you could use a mechanism of investment that would allow you to directly invest in um, value as opposed to just price following Intrinsic Research Co. Isn't that use just better? There is a way in which pragmatism, an advantage of pragmatism is a kind of alterological way. And I think a good, an alter, it kind of provides a sort of alterological option. Now, here's the issue though, it even if it functions that way, it's not sufficient in of itself because you then have your your uh, your forest farm and you're like, well, who cares? What am I going to do with it? You know, you have to have that community element as well. So it's not going. I'm not trying to say it can replace alterology. It just has that principle. And a really good book on that that we'll actually get into Karl Popper is um, Inquisitive um, Kindly Inquisitors by Jonathan Routes kind of talks about how beliefs and pragmatism can help in that way. And that's an interesting, um, a very interesting uh, argument he makes. Anyway, um, there is, I think, a way, this is where if one can present socioeconomic models like the garden, um, like hopefully Art Centering or Intrinsic Research Co., this has a manner of indeed creating a unity from people going, yeah, it would be great if there was this way to supply different diverse communities that approach meta um that approach the effort to translate meta modernism into meta modernity in their own unique way with their own unique action and so on and so forth uh that would be better than a world of which did not have that option uh because that world just looks like the pathological hyper um you know hyper capitalism that you see today um so that's a way in which i think you you um use per se can in fact uh unify in invaluable manners yeah and i would just pick up on that word of better like i think we need to really embrace better uh without being tied to like an ultimate well we need the ultimate good you know I and mean, it's always dialectics but um i i would say that like we need to embrace the idea that you can get to good from better Right? You can start with like, well, wouldn't this be better? And wouldn't this be better? And wouldn't this be better? And from that, you can sort of abstract out the principle of goodness. This is uh, like Jordan Peterson's work is, is largely about this, right? I feel sure. like part of the reason what made him so impactful was that people had, they were, their, their whole line of thinking, their whole path towards action was dependent on a belief in, a, in whatever it was, God or sure. you know, they had some ultimate 
grand narrative that like my individual action is serving this ultimate good. And then that was deconstructed. And so now it's like, what do I do? Because the only reason I was going to school was to get this job so that I could have this family and thus live in conformity with this uh, ideal that has been given to me. But now that ideal has been deconstructed. And so why should I even go to school, right? I feel like Jordan Peterson kind of came in and like, well, like, you know, wouldn't it be better though, if you could like put food on the table as opposed to live in the gutter? So, okay, so maybe you should do that, right? And then like, once you're there, wouldn't it like, wouldn't it be better if you had a family than if you just live by yourself? So maybe you should do that, right? And, and once you get into this process, you begin to recognize goodness as such, right? As an abstract uh, principle. And so I think that we need to embrace just uh, progress, like real progress, you know what I mean? Like progress where we, we do something and we say, okay, was this better or worse? And if it's better, then we go forward. And if not, then we draw back instead of, and this, this kind of undermines a lot of the, the modernist pathology, right? Because the modernists would say like, well, the ends justify the means, right? Communism is perfect. I've figured it out. I've analyzed it. Communism's the way. And so if we got to kill a few million people to get there, then, you know, you got to break a few eggs. Um, whereas I would say that like, it's got to be good. There has to be some sacrifice. There has to be some, like, we are going to have to go through some bad times to get to the good times, but the ends don't, or the, the yeah, the end doesn't justify the means in that, in that same kind of way. If you, uh, if you ally yourself with a philosophy of, of constant progress, constant betterment, as opposed to attaching yourself to a, an idol, basically. Well, what you're getting at, what I really appreciate is one of the reasons why, um, you know, I like kind of pragmatism, even though I, when I use pragmatism, I'm talking about C.S. Pierce, um, Pierce, Pierce, uh, I hear it both ways. I'm never sure myself. I'm just a simple Virginian boy. Um, but even though I think metamodern action is better of what the overarching term, because pragmatism is a road of better to good. Like, it's like, okay, okay, okay. Questions of God's existence aside, is it better to be able to like find where you put the squash versus not? Is it better to open your fridge and see it clean versus not? You know, whether God exists or not, it is, is it actually better to not have rotten fruit in the back of your fridge because you couldn't see it? And, you know, I think 99.9 .9 of people would say, yeah, it's, it's better not to forget I had a rotten squash in the back of the fridge that smells terrible because, boy, it smells terrible. Um, and it is very interesting that you see so pragmatists are kind of good at being like yeah it is better not to have squash rot in the back of your fridge because you forgot about it um you know uh so uh but instead we're like well you know we're beyond good and evil now so let the squash rot you know the pragmatist would be like i, I don't know about that you know i, I don't know about that um and it's just kind of funny how it's very difficult for us to say throw out the categories of good and evil as some slave um, slave master dialectic and, and, and not realize that it is better to make sure your kid doesn't run out in the middle of the road when you're, you know, when a car is coming, right? There is actually better. Um, I think a structure, well, but this also, Zach, I think, you know, there's this big kind of like, as you know, the game A versus game B, where game A is bad because of competition and game B is good because of coordination. Um... What we're getting at here is, in fact, why it, it's, it's, I think, very, I think it's interesting, this kind of narrative that exists for why competition came into existence. Yeah, we know that there's sexual rivalry. Yes, we know that there are egotists. But in regard to the socioeconomic system, one of the reasons competition came into um, being in the form of capitalism is precisely because we're not always good at telling what's better and we don't know what's better. And we actually have limited knowledge. You know, a lot of people will use the lack of perfect knowledge as evidence that capitalism doesn't work. No, 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 no. The lack of perfect knowledge is exactly why you have competition in the price mechanism. That's not evidence that those things don't work. Those are why those games came into existence. And so one of the things that I think game, when you just kind of talk about game A as this, and you know, I know Jim Rudd and you know, Daniel, Slime, these people will say, we're not saying game A was bad. It got millions upon billions of people out of poverty. I understand that what they're saying is you now need a negation sublation into something without competition and, and so on. That is a whole lot more difficult than may be appreciated because even if theoretically you were to get rid of every egotist on planet Earth, 
in every single example of sexual um, competition, you would actually still need something like competition in order to determine the better from the idea of the better. Well, that's, that's difficult. That's a problem. Because the moment you start talking about competition, uh, what's the nature of that competition that doesn't involve dynamics of a kind of rivalry? I'm not saying it's impossible. What does meta-modern competition look like? You know, what is a meta modern competition? What is game B competition? It is, it is, it's very simply, this is my point. When you talk about removing competition simply in terms of removing rivalry, you know, it sounds great. You're like, yes, that's what we're going to do. But when you talk about competition as necessary for solving the coordination problem, uh, that, that sucks. That's, a, that's an entirely different ball game, which I'm not sure if is a appreciated that's just maybe you have a different that's that's always something i wonder about well i mean uh no i i i 100 agree with you and i think uh th this would be one of my kind of sticking points with the game b and this is you know alexander bard has has talked on this and sure. Camille and um but yeah like you say competition is generative like competition is and it's, it's not just generative, but it's, it's uh, like, we need hierarchy. Like we need to, we need the best people to be in charge, right? Like we need to find out who is the best builder so that we can put that guy or girl in charge of building things, right? And so in order to figure out who's the best, we have to have a competition. There's no, like, there's no other way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you know, my solution to this problem, right? It's the garden is that, right. It's like it is. Uh, it is competitive in that there are many different gardens, and they're they're going to be. It's not that they're all fighting for the same resources, although they are in some sense. You know, I mean, because there's a there's a limited number of people who are going to want to be involved in this. Um, hopefully, hopefully there will be more jobs than people to fill them, and so that you know there's a selection mechanism going on there. Um, but it's ultimately like everyone. It it it. I don't want to say it does away with rivalry, but it, it uh, tries to, to um, diminish rivalry by setting up a, an incentive structure where like it doesn't help you to like if you're competing in such a way that you destroy your enemy, it doesn't help you because now there's one less garden and that means less funding for you and less right. people involved and like that's not good if you destroy another garden in your competition. Right? It's good for you if you show your way to be better so as to help the other garden. Right? It, it, it is set up that way in the incentive structure. Um, and so that would, that would be, like I totally agree with you, is that we need cooperation. Um, we need to be united, but you can't do away with competition. It's, yeah, it's necessary for sure. Well, you know, it, you know so a few things. Um, I think there seems to be a difference between competition to generate and competition to destroy maybe would be a, you know, argument that people would have. There's a friendly competition and there's the Icelandic revenge cycles or something. Uh, so there seems to be a difference there. Um, the thing is like with the game B conversation, like for example, you, you know, a lot of the game B is you have to replace the entire socioeconomic system. Well, maybe, maybe what you need to, so maybe instead of that, you just need to reform game A, right? Maybe instead you need to like proliferate nuclear energy you need to replace the um, reserve currency with, uh, I guess, special drawing rights and maybe change the central banking system, uh, destroy the college monopoly on credentials. Um, and 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 um, yeah, why not just those three things? You know, why an entire like if you why, why does um, why do you need game B instead of reform game A? Right. Um, which it, to me is a very important question, because game A seems to have um, well, and then I would add to that, indeed, uh, there would seem to be some sort of training people to handle different dialectical, like a certain philosophical conditioning. Or, well, but let's say you did those four things that I just described, okay? Would that mean you've entered game B or would that mean you reformed game A? Do you understand what the question I'm asking? You know, because that's to me what I'm not sure. Like, is, is game B a reformation of game A or is it a replacement of game B? It seems to depend on who you ask. Um, because if you're trying to replace um, competition entirely, um, that seems like a fool's errand and actually seems like you're going to get exactly what you're saying, uh, coordination problems and you're going to lose generation. But if we're talking about reforming game A, 
in in certain ways. Uh, well, that seems, yeah, I kind of agree with them. We, we might all die if we don't, right? There's this kind of imperative to game B where we're all going to die, basically, if we don't figure this out. I there's Yeah, I mean, I think for me, a lot of the strong, you know, Jim Rupp will talk about if there's a solar flare, we're basically all dead, right? We're in huge trouble. Like, we're very fragile. And he'll talk about, like, making society anti-fragile and things like that. I'm, I'm game. You know, yes, I agree that if game A, per se, if, this, if the current socioeconomic system does not become more, quote unquote, anti-fragile, um, we're in big trouble because it's true. A single solar flare at the right power who knows what the world would do at that point? That's a very fair point. We are not, I'm actually much more, let me put it this way. I've become much, and I know game B, you know, I didn't mean to get into the game B, because, but, it, but it's, I think, important because a lot of people present game B as indeed the meta modern community, right? That's what they present. So I, I think it's in line with the conversation. Um, to me, I become much more sympathetic when one talks about the need to move from game A to game B as a movement from fragility to anti-fragility versus a movement out of competition. Mm -hmm. I think if, if we want to describe game B as anti-fragility, I, 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 you've got, I'm much more interested in a sense. I'm not saying I'm not interested in game B, but to me, that's legitimate. Like, okay, all right. Now, what is anti-fragility? They may include getting rid of comp the competitive spirit as being part of, but to me, anti-fragile almost like requires competition. You know, it requires the, the, the roughness. For Nassim Tlaib, anti-fragility is something that gets stronger as you beat it up, you know, as you like try to destroy it, it gets stronger. And so for me, thinking of game B as game anti-fragile seems to be the way that you kind of bring together the pathos of Bard and, and some of the concerns of, of the game B people, which then, and then I'll give it back to you, we can think of what are... So these metamodern communities seem to also be having to engender anti-fragility. And I would say that dialectical life, the ability to be dialectical is in fact anti-fragile. You gain from the dialectic, you gain from the fragility of positions, you gain from the negation of your abstraction. There is a gaining that has an inherent anti-fragility to it, right? And so, so these metamodern communities would require a kind of anti-fragile action that then the question becomes, what is the economic system of the socioeconomic arrangement to make space for a diversity of experiment, experimentation that could carry out the processing of anti-fragile dialectical action as such? And that seems to be the garden. Uh, that seems to be one of, that's a great example. I think Intrinsic Research Co. is an example. I'm also a big proponent of breaking up the college monopoly on credentials because that removes the ability to have, um, wherever there's a monopoly, you have inefficiency. It's not that technically colleges have a monopoly on credentials. Yes, you can get a job without going to college, but on certain positions that tend to have certain social mobility, there is indeed a monopoly on credentials that college has. That seems to greatly hinder the ability of experimentation because then everyone has to follow a very similar track in order to climb and succeed in the society, which is going to then therefore reduce diversity of ways of life uh, and therefore not be metamodern. In fact, create something more practically totalizing because people are living similar, similar ways of life. Uh, so breaking up that seems to be part of it um, as well. But something about anti-fragility there seems a better framing. Yeah, so yeah, that, that was great. I want, to, uh, I want to address what you're saying about game B, but um, just quickly, I think the credentials, this calls up the, the idea that you and uh, Tim Adeline and Daniel Zeru were talking about, mm. about the guild, right? To me, the mm. guild is the answer to credentials, right? Um, and I don't know, you guys, you guys talked about that maybe better than I even could, so I'll, I'll just leave it there. But I, I do think the guild is like, um, like that's how we get credentials, is it's yes. this, this guild leader has said this person is qualified, right? And so you have it, therefore, on good authority that that person is qualified. It doesn't mean that they've, they've passed some test. It doesn't mean that they've gone through some program. It means this guy who knows what he's talking about has said that this guy is, is worthy. And we trust in the, the leader of the guild because they've shown themselves to be competent, right? Um, and the garden would provide the perfect, uh, I don't want to say perfect, but it would provide a, a good uh, place for that, that to occur. There could be many guilds operating within the garden at one time, um, and they could all have their own way of accrediting or, uh, you know, they can handle membership in, in whatever way they want. And they could just use the garden as a place to live and a place to work and a place to hang out. And um, 
all the rest of it. So I definitely agree with you on the, the monopoly on credentials needs to be broken up. And I think the guild is a good way to do that. Um, but as, as far as game B, like I, I definitely agree with you that I'm like, I honestly, I haven't listened to that much of the game B conversation because, uh, and I say this with love. Like, I, I think those guys are, uh, and girls are, are like, they're doing great work. And I feel like they are, like, they are proposing really, really deep and useful things, but it's, I mean, it's, it's just like, what is it? You know, <laughs> like it's, it's the same, it's Alexander Barr's critique. It's like, you guys are just saying game A is what we have now and game B is where we need to go. And that's, to me, that, that's kind of all that I've really heard. Out of it. But again, I haven't listened to that much. I don't know. Maybe, that, maybe, they're, maybe I'm totally wrong here and they're doing all sorts of wonderful things in the world that I'm just not aware of. Um, but like, to me, it's, I'm skeptical of it because to me, starting a new game means you're trying to change the rules of the game, right? Like games are defined yeah, by yeah, the yeah. rules by which they're played. And to me, that means governmental control. So to me, when you're talking about changing to a different game, that means installing a different government. And that to yes. me, is, you're just talking about revolution. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of, of that kind of revolution. Sure. Um, and so to me, it's like changing, like Bard has this idea of the split phallus, right? The, the priest and the chieftain, where the priest makes the laws and then the chieftain gives orders within that legal framework, right? right. Um, and so I think that to me, Game B is talking about a new priesthood. It's talking about a new legislative uh, order. Whereas to me, like the guide is in my mind, a chieftain, right? It's like, there's the government and there's the guide and the government makes the laws. The guide gives orders to his people or her people within those laws, but doesn't really try and change them. I mean, there is, there is always this dialectic and, you know, if something needs to be changed, then the, then the chieftain stands up and says, Hey priest, like you need to change something. Um, and if the, the chieftain's acting out of line, then the priest needs to come in and say, hey, you got to follow the rules. Um, but I wouldn't, I'm not trying to address it at the legislative nature or legislative uh, level. I'm not trying to change the rules of the game. I'm trying to take action within the rules of the game. Like, you know, to me, the rules of the game are what they are. Like, you get, whatever the game is, we can play it uh, in such a way that, that God wins. You know what I mean? That, like, I think, I think, a godly way of being will beat an ungodly way of being in any game. Uh, eventually, eventually, maybe not, maybe not right at first, but eventually in the long term. Um, and so, so that's what I would say about the game B is that I'm, I'm skeptical of anyone who's trying to change the rules of the game. Cause that to me speaks of, of imposition of law from fiat, as opposed to what I'm saying is like, let's just let the rules be what they are, but let's take action collectively coordinated action uh, within those rules. Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely. And I think it ties into what we were saying earlier about Hegel thinking the now. Um, there's this notion of, is it possible that a society could exist in which pathos is gone, uh, where sexual rivalry dynamics are gone? And what would that look like? Yes, that could be thought, but Hegel would be like, yeah, but we have no tradition of that. And it's not the now. Um, and so you're basically engaged in a form of alterology. Uh, you're engaged in a form of we can change if the rules were not this. Okay, well, if you could change the transcendent underpinnings of the universe or the nature of human beings or whatever, sure, yeah, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, basically, this is the issue. If you separate philosophy from alterology, then you have to accept the rules of the game, like what the rules are or what are, right? You know, that is the now. Now, if you want to posit the kind of world that could arise if you overthrew the government. Okay, Hegel would say, you should, you should be thinking about overthrowing the government now. <laughs> you should not be thinking, you know, sure, you can do a little thinking about what you're going to do after it. But can you even overthrow the government? Like, is that something that you can even assume? Uh, and, and it'd be like, oh, I guess not. Okay. Um, you know, and it's like, so basically Hegel would be like, okay, so like if an asteroid hit and everyone died and you were starting a new world, it would be game B. You'd be like, yes. Okay, well, you know, I guess that I hope that asteroid hits. Um, so, you know, so Hegel, so like basically the warning of Hegel is the danger of not thinking the now, not thinking in terms of the rules. Because, sure, is it possible that we could eventually, through technological augmentation, ontologically design people out of their sexual rivalry dynamics? Could we possibly ontologically design, to use Mr. Frager's term, average people to have an IQ of maybe 180, higher empathy, 
to greater tolerance of diversity. Could we engineer everyone to be shaman, right? You know, bard, shaman, could, could we do it? Maybe, but, but that's not the now. If we could, what kind of world could we live in? A different one. Uh, but you have now engaged in alterology, you see? And you see that for me, I think is what you said uh, is very well put. What can happen, I think, in the game beat. Now, again, I, Mr. Rutt made very clear that they're trying to start small experimental communities following game B. They're going to see what, what does a game B business look like. And I find that very noble, uh, that actually there's an effort to engage in small scale experimentation. And Mr. Rutt seems very all in on that and aware of that. And in fact, sounds similar to us describing experimentation. I think that's a wonderful thing. I think that's very, very important. Um, so, so that should be noted. Um, the issue that can happen with a conversation, basically any social, so, um, any design of society can smuggle in alterology without realizing it. Um, it, it without, and that's why keeping them separate could be so good. Like if you start saying, what kind of world would we create? Like if we take Thomas More's Utopia, right? Like you are smuggling in an alterology because you're treating human beings as operating according to a different tendency than what we tend to see play out in history under similar conditions. Like if we talk about human nature, which I know is a dangerous phrase, but, but there is something we can at least talk about called human probability, if by nature you mean probability. When humans lack food, we do tend to know what they tend to do right? If people don't have food, they tend to rise up against their government. It's not definite, it's not determined, but there's a pretty good probability that that is what starts to occur if you have food shortages in a, in a nation over long enough time, right? Not always, because maybe the people are oppressed by the military to the point where they're scared to rise up, so it's contingent, but there are certain, there's some certain good bets that one can make about what humans tend to do under, or under similar circumstances. Um, so there is something like that at play. And if you were to simply present an alternative under alterology in the background that proposes humans acting differently than what they tend to act given those conditions, well then sure, one can design whatever society that they like. Um, so that can be a mistake that occurs. So I think for me, metamodern pragmatic, metamodern action, metamodern communities indeed should think the now and therefore operate within the rules of the game we have now. It should operate within the rules of how we tend to see humans operate. And that tends to be competitively. Now, they don't tend to always act in a competition that is deadly. That, you know, you could indeed posit that we can get rid of that. But if you're trying to get rid of competition entirely, that, that doesn't seem to work. That seems to go against what we see in human tradition because humans like to know where they stand. Like boys like to know where they stand with the other people want to know where they stand around other people, right? Should they want to know that? It's a different question. Maybe all the boys on the playground should just be themselves and not want to know where they stand. But history is a story of people wanting to know where they want to stand. Do you want to imagine a world where that's not what happens? Do you want to engage in that alterology? Go right ahead, but that's not what we see. So there is going to be some kind of competition. Also, um, do you want to imagine a world where computers are able to calculate the best, say, water cooling or air conditioning company without um, competition or price mechanisms? Would you like to imagine that world where quantum computing can figure that out all? Go right ahead. But that's not what we see. The now is that we as human beings don't seem to be able to figure out what air conditioning company is best without competition, pricing mechanism, and consumer votes, which is basically every time you vote, you're, every time you buy something, you're voting is basically what's going on. Um, we do not know of a world in which we're able to figure out the best air conditioning, the best restaurant, the best food, the best cook, whatever, without a system of competition. So one must think within that. Uh, and, and what would that look like? And I think, I think if you don't do that, you are smuggling in alterology. And, and if you're doing that, then you need to justify that shift. Uh, you need to justify philosophy to philosophical alterology to alterology. You need to make that move. And very often, I don't think that move is made at all. And that leads to um, problems. Oh, man, I just, I agree with you so much. And I see this in the world all the time. It's like, well, if the world were like this, and it's like, well, okay, but the world isn't like that. Okay, let's start with the way <laughs> the world. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that would be great. That would be, that would be awesome if we had AI that could just solve everything. Like, I have a, 
I have a good friend who's who's uh, who's, <laughs> who's very oh, yeah. like. Well, in the future, we'll have the AI, and they'll just solve everything. It's like, well, but right now we don't have that, and so maybe yeah. we should think in that context. Oh no! I just before I forget, like um, alterology, you can also kind of think of it as alternate dimensions. Like if you posit a dimension where humans are active, and you posit a dimension where computers are able to solve the pricing coordination, sure, uh, you know, sure, but that's all alterology. And actually, what worries me. You know, Keynes warned that if you like lower, if you raise interest rate, no, raise interest rates, it sends signal to the market about the future and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where, you know, the market crashes because you sent a signal that it should crash and it wouldn't have crashed if you didn't do that becomes self-fulfilling. I think something very similar is actually happening with like computers where people are like, well, the, the computers are going to solve that. You know, we're going to, so we don't think the now because we're just like, you know, the computers will solve it as a result, it doesn't. You know, maybe the computers would solve the problem if we thought the now in the in a manner that would program the computers in the future to better do their job. But we're not going to do that because we're just thinking about the computer solving everything. So there's this way in which actually I think this is actually also a good example is one of the reasons you have the supply chain crisis is because you told all the truck drivers they were going to lose their jobs. So they're like, okay, I won't be a truck driver. And now no one's delivering the gun. So we're not going to get to the economy where you have self-driving cars because before we got there, all the truck drivers quit and the economy collapsed. And that notion of time is actually, actually one of the great problems that happens with alterology is like people are like, well, the computers will solve everything. So we don't have to think that now we can assume the future. And so we then put forth things that don't, that can't, that, that are not now based. And thus the diet, even if there is a dialectic, it becomes fruitless because it's not grounded on the correct now. Yeah, no, that was beautifully put, man. Um, and I totally agree. And so, yeah, I think uh, this might be a good place to close.